Saturday Morning Cartoons, what was once a huge staple of American pop culture, has now become a thing of the past. After a long week of school, there was nothing better than to sit in front of the TV, eat your sugary cereal, and watch some of the animated programming Big 3 Networks, later 5, had to offer. Today with the rise of streaming services like Netflix and Disney Plus, and television slowly dying, children can watch their favorite animated shows anytime they want. However. One of the pioneers of Saturday morning cartoons would arguably be the animation studio Hanna-Barbera. Founded by former MGM animators William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, these two men will create some of the most memorable cartoon characters of the 20th century for nearly four decades. Join me, 47 Cartoon Guy, as I go through the rich history of one of the most influential animation studios and the impact they made. So let's not waste any time, let's get started. William Denby Hanna was born July 14, 1910 in Melrose, New Mexico. Later on, his family moved west to Los Angeles. Hanna was a shy outdoor enthusiast, and for many years, he was an Eagle Scout, later being promoted to Scoutmaster as an adult. Hanna also had a love for music, which carried over to his animation career as he wrote many songs for some of their cartoons he helped create, like the Flintstones. Bill studied journalism and engineering at Compton Junior College but he had to drop out due to the Great Depression. It took a number of odd jobs. One of them was working with his father and other engineers of the construction of the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. It was there he learned about a new company that was headed by two men from Kansas City, Rudolph Ising and Hugh Harmon, who had then recently parted with Walt Disney, who started his own studio. The two had been hired to create cartoons for Warner Brothers through Leon Schlesinger. Despite a lack of formal art training, Hannah applied for a job it was hired. I started in the cartoon business in 1930 with Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising making the first Looney Tunes and Merry Melody. Hannah started as a custodian and cell washer until eventually becoming head of the ink and paint department. Hannah enjoyed the company of his supervisors and sometimes stayed at their hours to contribute songs and pitch gags, which were later used in some of the studio's Bosco cartoons. Hannah was able to convince Hugh to let him work on the time end of the cartoons as well. After a business disagreement with Schlesinger, Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising began producing cartoons independently for MGM in 1933, and Hannah followed them. He learned a lot from the two men, which came in handy when it was time to direct his first cartoon, To Spring. The short, which was co-directed by Paul Fennell, was about little gnomes who mine colorful crystals as they prepare for the springtime. After Rudolph and Ising's contract was up, the two left MGM, but Hannah stayed. MGM decided to open their own animation studio and was now under the leadership of former theater owner Fred Quimby. MGM, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, was like a city. It had its own fire department, its own police department, a boss, Louis B. Mayer. It was the Tiffany's of movie studios. Mandate from Louis B. Mayer is. You know, with MGM's the biggest, greatest studio in Hollywood, we should have the finest of everything. Why don't we have the finest cartoons? MGM's first series was based on a comic strip called Captain and the Kids. Hannah was the director, along with Bob Allen and Fritz Freeling, but the cartoons never took off with audiences, and the shorts were canceled. At the time, Freeling left MGM to go back to Schlesinger, 
and MGM rehired Rudolph at Ising. And it was there that I met Joe. Joseph Roland Barbera was born March 24, 1911 on the Lower East Side of New York. The son of Sicilian immigrant parents, Barbera grew up in New York City. He was suave, smooth, and a man of many talents, acting in school productions, editing his high school newspaper, and writing short stories. He was a skilled boxer, a career choice he turned down once he learned he had a passion for drawing. After school, he landed a job at the Irving Trust Bank and took several art classes at night at the Art Students League on 57th Street. Barbera submitted his cartoons to popular magazines in Manhattan, but after a string of rejections, his artworks was finally published at Collier's Weekly. Joe was one of the many moviegoers that was fascinated by the Disney Silly Symphony short, The Skeleton Dance. So much so that Barbera wrote to Walt Disney in California, and a future media mogul wrote back promising he would look him up during his next trip to New York. Unfortunately, Walt never got back with Joe. Despite this, Joe still had an interest in animation. It took a job at the studio of Max Fleischer's, but quit after four days. He gained a better position at Van Buren Studios, a small animation studio owned by RKO. Barbera was able to impress his boss with his ability to create cartoon gags and moved up to animator and storyman. Unfortunately, this would be a job he would lose due to the Great Depression. He then moved to Terry Tunes, the studio that would later be known for Mighty Mouse, Heckle and Jekyll. Oh yeah, and this. Somebody touch my spaghetti! Joe worked as an animator, hoping to be more involved in the story process. In fact, he went to Paul Terry, founder of Terry Tunes, to present a storyboard with an original character he created, a pilot named Dirty Doug. Paul wasn't impressed. Joe wasn't satisfied with his time at Terry Tunes, so he quit after seven months and moved to MGM. It was at MGM where Bill and Joe first met and hit it off right away. Out of boredom, they decided to come up with an idea of their own. Pretty soon, we were sitting there in a room. He ended up in a room with me as storyman. So one time I said, why don't we do a cartoon of our own? Well, we're sitting here, you know? So. We set the pattern for the way it was going to work out. Oh, we decided to do a cat and a mouse, which had been done 4,000 times before that. It was about as original as my foot, you know. Nevertheless, I wanted to do a cat and mouse because, number one, the minute you see a cat and mouse on the screen, you know there's conflict. And you got chase. And I, I loved that whole idea. So we designed a cat and a mouse. On February 10th, 1940, Bill and Joe's creation, the animated short Puss Gets the Boot, was released to theaters. It featured a mouse named Jinx being harassed by a cat named Jasper. After breaking a vase during a chase, Jasper gets a strict warning by his owner, Mammy Two Shoes. Now understand this, Jasper. If you break one more thing, you is going out. O W T out. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get to her later. Jumping at this opportunity, Jinx wastes no time making Jasper's life a living hell so he can get thrown out of the house. During production, the staff at MGM merely scoffed at the idea, especially Fred Quimby. But the short was a huge hit, he even got nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Short, only to lose to another MGM short, The Milky Way. Coincidentally enough, another short that was up for an Oscar that year was the very first defined Bugs Bunny cartoon, A Wild Hair directed by future animation legend and friend of Bill's, Fred Tex Avery. In the meantime, Quimby in his, his wisdom said, don't make any more of them. He said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And with that, Bill and Joe went off to make one-off cartoons, such as the incredibly racist Swing Social, The Goose Goes South, The Journey of a Little Goose Traveling South on Foot, Since He Can't Fly, galloping gals about fillies who are racers at the Kentucky Derby and a juicy gossip they tell each other, and Officer Pooch about a canine officer trying to save a bunch of kittens. Quimby would change his mind about not making any more cat and mouse pictures due to popular demand and gave Bill and Joe the go-ahead to continue their runaway hit. Starting with the next cartoon, The Midnight Snack, the cat and mouse duo was finally giving their names, Tom and Jerry. It would go on to star with 114 cartoon shorts for MGM. Audiences fell in love with these characters. Despite being normally silent, both Tom and Jerry had a ton of personality in their designs, expressions, and animation. The two were so versatile they could be put into any situation and setting. Hannah and Barbara managed to keep the formula fresh by introducing new characters such as Spike the Bulldog, his son Tyke, 
a little duck who Jerry protects, a nephew of Jerry's named Nibbles, and a constant change of owners for Tom. I suppose I should also address the elephant in the room. While Tom and Jerry was and still one of the best cartoons of the golden age of animation, unfortunately there were certain jokes, gags, and characters that could now be considered bad taste. Particularly the character of Mammy Two Shoes. She was voiced by film and radio actress Lillian Randolph, who was known for playing maids at the time. The character speaks in a stereotypical manner. <laughs> yes, sir, Thomas, you is a hero. Here's a reward for getting rid of that mouse. It's uncomfortable to watch, and I'm not going to pretend it isn't. And while I don't think it's nearly as offensive as what other studios were doing, the point still stands. Images like this are not okay. In the 60s, when the shorts aired on CBS Saturday mornings, Mammy was redrawn to be a thin white woman, and even sometimes recolored and dubbed over by June Foray. And in the 1990s, her voice was redubbed by actress Theodore Vidal. Thomas, is that you sleeping? While these hurtful images were wrong then and wrong today, removing them but pretending they didn't exist can be just as harmful. That's why many of these cartoons have been restored to their original form on DVD and Blu-ray for historical reasons. The shorts will become so popular they will be nominated for 13 Academy Awards, but winning 7. Tom and Jerry also became pop culture icons. During this time they will appear in advertisements, comics, even cameos, dancing with the likes of Gene Kelly, and swimming with Esther Williams. Of course, Fred Quimby, who put down the idea at first, had no problem accepting the Oscars. Fred Quimby was the one who went up <laughs> and got the Oscar each time. Because it's always the producer is the one who goes up to get the Oscar. There is uh, a series of photos of the Tom and Jerry unit posing with these seven Oscars. They got those photos by waiting until Quimby went to lunch and then sneaking into his office with a camera. That's as close as they ever got to As the shorts went on, the evolution of the characters would begin to change, not only in style, but in tone as well. The shorts became more violent, more energetic, and fast-paced, thanks to the influence of MGM's newest director, Tex Avery. When Tex Avery came to MGM in the early 40s from Warner Brothers, he really hit his stride. He was doing funny cartoons at Warner's, but he still hadn't really blossomed as the outrageous master of comedy timing and uh, outlandish gags that he became. And when he started making those cartoons there, you can bet that Bill and Joe were paying attention. Tom and Jerry unit at MGM was a well-oiled machine. A typical idea for a cartoon might begin with a brainstorming session by the crew where gags, situations, and titles were tossed. Barbera would then draw the entire storyboard, and once it was done, Hannah would take it, time the action on exposure sheets, and hand the scenes over to the animators. The animators included Carlo Vinci, Irv Spence, Ed Barge, Ken Muse, Ray Patterson, as well as a few others. Also, an office boy in MGM was a young man named Jack Nicholson. Yes, that Jack Nicholson. He was offered a job as an in-betweener, but he declined, and the rest, as they say, is history. And let's not forget those iconic sound effects. They were, you know, among the brashest sound effects in any cartoon. If Tom steps on a board that's loose, the sound you hear is a gunshot. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like this violent sound that, that really makes the gag even funnier. The series' most famous sound effect, Tom's blood-curling scream, was provided by Bill Hanna himself. Scott Bradley's orchestrations also played a huge part in the shorts. Scott Bradley is one of the most unsung film composers, I think, in the history of film. There's something about that big, full MGM orchestra that's part of the musicals and part of the epic dramas that they would do. And to hear that same orchestra, you know, emoting for Tom or Jerry in a particular scene is, is, is funny unto itself. The music tells you if Jerry is happy, or Tom is sneaky. You know, it really tells the audience, it signals what the mood is of that scene. After the retirement of Fred Quimby, Bill and Joe were promoted to head of the MGM animation department, still working on Tom and Jerry shorts, as well as taking over Drooby cartoons. Little did they know, their tenure at MGM was about to come to an end. 
Yes, you'll find this Westinghouse set so easy to enjoy. The smoothest operating television you can get today. Television became commercially available in the mid-50s, and everyone was getting one. This meant bad news for theaters, which were losing revenue at the box office, and the studios were trying new gimmicks to get more butts and seats, such as 3D. That wasn't the only problem. But Tom and Jerry was so successful that when we re-released cartoons that we did four or years ago and brought them back and re-released them again, they did as well as new cartoons. So they said brilliantly, ho ho, we can save production of new cartoons by just re-releasing the cartoon. And in doing so, they would save maybe, I think the number they were talking about was six or seven hundred thousand dollars by not doing any new ones. Well, I tell you, his two adults who thought they were sitting on top of the world suddenly find themselves out of work. But total quick, like with about two weeks' salary after 20 years, you know, that's all you got. It was our belief that we would still be at MGM making Tom and Jerry cartoons today. Uh, and it didn't take long, though, until you could see that the handwriting was on the wall. Uh, and MGM, the cartoons that we were making, uh, they were used, but uh, you could see that television was making big inroads on the box office, the money. We felt that we could probably continue. Even then, we thought maybe we could make stuff for television, but there was no real thinking of that at all until uh, they closed the studio, and then we started thinking TV right away. The Tom and Jerry shorts ended its run on 1958. Final cartoon Bill and Jill directed together, Tot Watchers, about Tom and Jerry trying to put a baby out of harm's way, as his neglectful babysitter is too preoccupied talking on the phone with one of her girlfriends. Yeah, not really one of their best shorts. Soon after, the MGM cartoon studio was closed down. Three years later, MGM revived the cat and mouse duo for new shorts, directed by the late Czech animator Gene Deitch, and made by European animation studio Rembrandt Films. These shorts were often low budget, crude looking, and surreal, with weird sound design and mumbled dialogue. Gene told me, like, he got, I think they got three Tom and Jerry's to look at. They sent them three prints. I don't know which ones they were, but that's what the animators had to study to learn to draw the characters. They didn't get any model sheets, no old drawings, nothing. Just send them three prints of old Tom and Jerry said, okay, this is enough for you. This run didn't last long and ended in 1962, but for whatever reason, it would gain a cult following in recent years. In 1963, animator Chuck Jones, who was just let go for Warner Brothers, started Sip Tower 12 Productions and created some new Tom and Jerry shorts. Chuck was not a fan of the original Tom and Jerry's and had trouble adapting his own style into the series which explains why they feel like pale imitations of his Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons. While Joe's cartoons were better received, his run with the characters ended in 1967, and he moved on to making television specials in a 1970 fantasy film, The Phantom Tollbooth. With the closing of the MGM animation department, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera began contemplating on the idea of producing cartoons for television. After all, they have some experience. They were the ones responsible for the animation of the opening credits of the sitcom I Love Lucy. This is back when they were still under contract with MGM and Fred Quimby was none the wiser. So in 1957, HP Enterprises opened its doors on a lot of clean studios, formerly Charlie Chaplin Studios. George Sidney, the director of Anchors Away, served as Bill and Joe's business partner. Most of their animators at MGM became a new staff of HP, along with conductor and composer Hoyt Curtin. Because there are massive layoffs in the animation industry, they were able to hire writers like Mike Maltese, Warren Foster, and animators like Tony Benedict, Willie Idol, and Alex Lovey. With Disney's Sleeping Beauty ended production, many of the animators who were just laid off migrated to HB Enterprises. With movie theaters shutting down their animation divisions, leaving many out of work, to these talented artists, Hanna-Barbera was more than an animation studio. It was a godsend. The lucky part of the whole disaster at MGM is they had to release the best group of animators all over the world, and we brought these people back to our studio. We had a ready-made army. We got the best story people from Leon Schlesinger and artists from Disney. We simply took on the most talented people from all over. 
Billinger worked on presentations to pitch to distributors like MCA and 20th Century who passed. One person that was interested was John H. Mitchell, Vice President of Screen Gems, a distributor of Columbia Pictures. John believed there was a place for cartoons among the many anthology series, sitcoms, and variety shows. Mitchell commissioned five-minute segment for bookends for theatrical cartoons. This would lead to the very first television show from Hannah and Barbara, The Rough and Ready Show, which debuted Saturday morning, December 14, 1957 on NBC. And while it wasn't the first cartoon to ever air exclusively for television, it would be the beginning of the studio's long legacy. Before then, Saturday mornings for kids usually consisted of serials like The Lone Ranger, Rin Tin Tin, and Howdy Doody, and cartoons that did air were usually theatrical shorts to be broadcast for television. Rough and Ready revolved around the adventures of a dog and a cat who are best friends as they have run-ins with many recurring villains. The show also had live action segments hosted by Jimmy Blaine. It was also the first show for the studio that used a new innovative technique, limited animation. Since budgets for television were higher, fewer drawings were needed. The budget for a typical Tom and Jerry cartoon will be about $50,000, but at Screen Gems, they were given $2,700 for five minutes. Limited animation. Now, a lot of people don't understand what that means, and they think it's not great animation. But if you don't have the money, you have to think of some other way to do it. The essence of planned animation is putting different parts of a figure on different cells. And uh, that is really the breakthrough. They came up with the idea of if the body doesn't have to move, say it's Yogi Bear, if he's standing and talking to somebody, all he's got to do is move his head. Really all that has to happen is the lips are moving. So the lips are moving on one cell, the head is on another cell, which moves only every so often, the body is on a third cell, and it's not moving at all for a good long chunk of dialogue. According to William Hanna, back at MGM, our budget was lavish enough to allow as many as 60 drawings per foot of fully animated film. It was a new ball game for TV. In order to meet our budget for Rough and Ready, we had a pair of drawings down to no more than one or two per of film. It was also decided that voice actors were needed to help balance out the noticeably cheaper animation. Unlike the silent Tom and Jerry, Rough and Ready would speak and would be performed by actors Doss Butler, who had done several voices for MGM and Warner Brothers, and Don Messick, an announcer and former ventriloquist. The two would become Hanna-Barbera's longtime voice actors and would remain with the company until their respective deaths, Butler in 1988 and Messick in 1997. Dawes Butler would be best known for voicing Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Draw McGraw, Elroy Jetson, Snagglepuss, Wally Gator, and countless others. While Don Messick's famous role would be Scooby Doo, he would also be known for Boo Boo Bear, Ranger Smith, Bam Bam Rubble, Astro from the Jetsons, Dr. Benny Quest, Ricochet Rabbit, Adamant, Muttley, and many more. Other Hanna Barbera voice actors would later include regulars John Stevenson, Julie Bennett, Howard Morris, Paul Fries, Jude Foray, Doug Young, Gene Vanderpool, and Janet Waldo. Even a man of a thousand voices, Mel Blanc, would lend his voice to some of the studio's famous characters. Rough and Ready aired for three seasons on NBC and would later end his run in 1960. While the show was a moderate hit for Bill and Joe's new company, the best was yet to come. In early 1958, cereal manufacturing company Kellogg's was interested in sponsoring a children's show for marketing purposes. Originally a part of a weekday lineup featuring programs aimed at kids such as Wild Bill Hickok, The Adventures of Superman, and rebroadcast Woody Woodpecker shorts. Joseph Barbera pitched the idea of a cartoon to Kellogg's executives through their ad agency Leo Burnett. After looking through the scripts and characters, they liked what they saw and bought it.
The Huckleberry Hound Show featured the antics of a slow-talking blue dog, known for his southern drawl and his off-key singing of Clementine, as he gets himself into the wacky situations in each episode. The show would have three different segments so that the show would be easier to script and there are a lot more room for flexibility if ever the audience or sponsor disliked a particular segment. Huck was voiced by Dawes Butler, who played a similar sounding character in several Tex Avery Droopy cartoons. Anyway, a Huckleberry Hound is more laconic and laid back, and I got the idea for him uh, down in North Carolina where my wife was from, Albemarle, North Carolina. And when I was in the Navy, I'd come home on a weekend with my little ditty bag to see her and a hitchhike, you know. And so this father would be sitting on the front porch next door. He was a veterinarian, worked with her daddy, with her daddy as a veterinarian too. And he'd see me come in, you know, panting just to see Murtis. And he'd say, hi, dogs, come on in and set yourself down. What's going on? Anyway, he kind of stuck in my head, and I was in the Navy then, but I put him in a little separate box. I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then when Huckleberry Hound came up, there he was. <laughs> Other segments of the show included Pixie and Dixie and Mr. Jinx, a continuation of the cat and the mouse concept about two mice and a dumb cat who hates them to pieces, and perhaps the most famous segment of the show, Yogi Bear, about a smarter than average bear and his sidekick Boo Boo, who steal picnic baskets trying to avoid the park ranger, Ranger Smith. This character would become just as popular as Huckleberry and become a superstar in his own right, spinning off into his own series in 1960, along with many follow-ups, merchandise, and becoming one of the studio's mascots. Since Kellogg sponsored the program, commercials were made to show the characters promoting the brand's various cereal products. These segments had noticeably more fluid animation as opposed to the actual show. The Huckleberry Hound show debuted in syndication in 1958 and became a surprise hit. Critics and audiences fell in love with the likable array of characters and the witty puns and humor, as well as being a breath of fresh air from all the detective private eye TV shows debuted that season. And it was the hidden ratings. I remember Time Magazine ran a big article on, on the Huckleberry Hound Show. I mean, it was just, uh, I bet the network just probably got ratings numbers like they'd never had before. The show had paved the way for more funny Animal Hanna Barbera cartoons throughout the 60s, like the Quick Draw McGraw Show, the A Formation Yoga Bear Show, Magilla Gorilla, and many others, as we'd be introduced to a wide variety of characters, like Hokey Wolf, who replaced the Yogi segment on Huckleberry Hound after he spun off to his own show, Snagglepuss, Yaggy Doodle, Snooper and Blabber, and Augie Doggy and Doggy Daddy. While fan clubs and merchandise grew, on a night of the 1960 Emmy Awards, the show made history as the first ever animated series to win for Outstanding Children's Program and made HB Enterprises, now Hanna-Barbera Productions, a household name as well as the leader of television animation. Barbera Hannah would look great on the top of the building. You, you, you'd be my guest. Oh, sure. Now that they made their mark on syndication and Saturday mornings, there was one area of television Bill and Joe were dying to experiment with. Prime time. When the Huckleberry Hound show debuted, Bill and Joe were shocked to learn that a large percent of the 16 million views the show had were adults and college students, and bars were frequently advertised the show during happy hour. According to Joe Barbera, in one San Francisco bar favored by the college crowd, the barkeep would ring a bell at 6 in the evening when the show was aired and direct the patrons' attention to a sign that announced, No tinkling of glasses or noise during the Huckleberry Hound Show. This persuaded the duo to create the very first original adult-oriented primetime animated sitcom, which of course became The Flintstones, a Stone Age take on a traditional family sitcom featuring cavemen. With a loudmouth but well-meaning Fred, his snarky but loving wife Wilma, his dopey best friend Barney Rubble, and his wife Betty. The idea of a primetime cartoon aided at adults was unheard of at the time, and the road to make it happen was a long one. After all, this was the age of the Donna Reed Show, Red Skeleton, and General Electric Theater, not to mention CBS and NBC turning it down for being too oddball, too risky. No one had even dared think about a Flintstone show. By that I mean a primetime animated show. Who could do that? I mean, how could you turn that out? A half hour a week? Are you kidding? The concept of the show went through many changes throughout this development. We had a hillbilly family we tried, a Roman family, a uh, pilgrim family, Indian family. We finally got down to cave. 
When we got the cave, it was those things, like I said, stoneway piano that got your mind going. And also, you were able to take anything that was current and convert it to stone age. Like clothespins were birds with beaks that would open up and they would hold the laundry. A vacuum cleaner was a small mastodon. Um, we would put wheels under him and his snout would pick up. That was our vacuum cleaner. And we never dressed any attention to it. We just threw those things in and the kids loved it. So it became that kind of a thing. The show was originally called The Flagstones until HB was forced to change the name due to the threat of legal action of High and Lowest creator Mort Walker because the name sounded similar to his cartoon family, the Flagstons. A common trend of Hanna-Barbera cartoons was that their characters were spoofs of popular celebrities or TV shows at the time. Yogi Bear was based on comedian Art Carney, Snagglepuss was based on Burt Lahr, and the Hillbilly Bears was based on the Beverly Hillbillies. The Flintstones was no exception, as it was a send-up of the popular sitcom The Honeymooners. One of the people who took notice was Jackie Gleason, According to Marla Brooks, author of the book, The American Family on Television, Jackie's lawyers told him he could probably have the Flintstones cancelled if he wanted to, but in the same breath also asked, do you want to be known as the guy who yanked Fred Flintstone off the air? The guy who took away a show that so many kids love and so many of their parents love too? Apparently, Jackie thought it over and decided to leave well enough alone. Another influence on the Flintstones would arguably be the MGM cartoon, The First Bad Man, directed by Tex Avery. The short, featuring a fictionalized version of Texas in 1 million BC, features similar designs and sight gags that would be seen on the Flintstones. Ed Benedict, who created the look of the Flintstones, as well as many other early HB cartoons, was also the layout artist of the short. He had a kind of an abstract way of, of drawing and it was perfect for this simplistic uh, design style that, for, for TV animation. But he had a real strong uh, flat UPA-like design style which I think they felt would not only be simple to animate but it was very bold, it had a very very strong outlines, it would read on TV sets no matter how bad the reception was and he was, he's a brilliant designer. For the voices, HB would get radio and screen actor Alan Reed to voice Fred, Gene Vanderpool, whose previous role for Hanna-Barbera included the Winsome Witch, voiced Wilma, Man of a Thousand Voices Mel Blanc, would do double duty as the voice of Barney Rubble and of Flintstone's pet Dino, a Pinnacle Junction actress Bo Benadaret for voice Betty. According to Joe Barbera, selling the show proved to be no easy task. I mean, here we are with a brand new thing that's never been done before. An animated primetime show. So, we uh, developed two storyboards with Dan Gordon, whose picture I showed you. Earlier. So now, I go back to New York with his portfolio with our two half-hour boards stacked in there and some other artwork. And we go along, I mean, and no one would even believe that you dared to suggest a thing like that. I mean, they looked at you as you were crazy. But slowly the word got out that I used to do the presentation. But nobody bought it. I mean, you can go along and do this, which I did for eight straight weeks. Pitch, 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 sometimes five a day. So finally, on the very last day, Leonard Goldenson, head of ABC, Danny Melnick, who was still around, and I think it was Tom Moore or Ollie Trays, showed up at the, I think it was my hotel, and bought the show in 15 minutes. The show made its debut on ABC on September 1960 with the first episode, The Flintstone Flyer, and while critics weren't exactly kind to the show, with Variety calling it an ink and paint disaster, viewers made the show a surprise success finishing the season at number 18 in overall Nielsen ratings and giving ABC their bona fide hit that wasn't a western. The Flintstones were memorable for breaking new ground in animation, such as the story arc of having Wilma be pregnant with Pebbles, who was originally Fred Jr., and the applied issue of infertility, which led to the Rubbles to adopt Bam Bam. Though because of this, the show became shifted more towards families than adults, and if that didn't drive the point home, the arrival of a new character towards the end of the show certainly did. The tiny space alien, the Great Gazoo, voiced by famed comedian 
Harvey Corman. I was only about 13 of those episodes that had the Great Gazoo in it, and it was an enormously popular character. As a matter of fact, some years back, I traveled for Hanna-Barbera. They had these huge uh, conventions and seminars where uh, collectors collect cells. And the cells with the Great Kazoo on it are worth lots of money. And uh, I never realized how, you know, I still get the little guy and people are, you know, collectors, uh, you know, on eBay and stuff, and they want my autograph. And I, it was a very popular character, the Great Kazoo. I just made him sort of, uh, you know, dum dum, you know, very, you know, uh, superior and arrogant and elite. The show lasted six years from 166 episodes. It was the longest running primetime animated series ever made until 1997 when the Fox series, The Simpsons, broke the record and kept on going and going and going and going. During and after the show's run, The Flintstones was a merchandising hit, selling everything from cigarettes, beer, vitamins, to even breakfast cereal that's still being sold to this day. Not to mention many of the toys and games. And Fred Flintstone would become the main mascot of Hanna-Barbera, Bill and Jill's Mickey Mouse. Starting in the 1970s, the show had a second life on Saturday mornings with many revivals with the last series, Cave Kids, airing in 1996, as well as many primetime specials. The Flintstones also made many top greatest cartoon lists, and needless to say, it set the standard for many popular primetime adult cartoons to come. Today, not only is the Flintstones regarded as Hanna-Barbera's best work, it's important to television animation in general. It really was the first time that everybody could admit the cartoons were for everybody. Now you have shows, animated shows, that have the similar kind of loyalty to them. In that way, the Flintstones kind of set us on the trend that we're on now. The success of the Flintstones and other shows made by HB will lead to more expanding the studio, as well as more crew members joining. Aside from former Warner Brothers storymen, Warren Foster and Michael Maltese as head writers, and many of Bill and Joe's animators from MGM, new talent was brought in to keep up with the high demand, such as editor Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. Remember them, they'll be important later. And artists such as Don Lusk, Bill Perez, Charles A. Nichols, former Warner Brothers and UPA artists, Bob Singer and Jerry Eisenberg, son of MGM animator and comic artist Harvey Eisenberg. Another animator that would join the studio was a young Japanese man who worked at Disney as an assistant to the legendary Milk Call. He would go on to become one of the most prominent designers and his name was Ibu Takamoto. Joe Barbera's daughter Jane would later join the studio as an ink and paint supervisor, eventually moving her way up to head of production, a position she held well into the 90s. They would also outgrow their old studio. In 1963, the crew moved to their new home at 3400 Coenga Boulevard in Studio City and remained there until 1997. Well, this place is certainly busy. I understand you've been in your new studio only a couple of months and already you're pushing the walls out. We certainly are. I guess you fellas have created more successful cartoon series for television than all other producers combined. Sit down, George. How do you account for it? Well, George, since you ask a serious question, I'll try to give you a serious answer. You see, Bill and I believe in entertainment. We've never tried to preach in our pictures. We just try to project warmth and good feeling. Our real stock in trade is wholesome fun, and for that we found there is no age limit. While many other cartoons came and went, such as the short-lived Top Cat, a primetime cartoon about a street-smart con artist cat, and his gang based upon a similar character played by comedian Phil Silvers, others made their debut, like the Jetsons. Similar to the Flintstones, it featured a family of the future, as introduced in a theme song, George Jetson, his boy Elroy, daughter Judy, and Jane his wife. The show gave the artists many opportunities to play around with many adventures and futuristic technology. Writer and designer Tony Benedict brought in a book called 1975, showing when new ideas and appliances would be available that year. The show debuted prime time on ABC in 1962 and became very popular with audiences but had the misfortune of airing in a time slot against two bigger shows, CBS's Dennis the Menace and NBC's The Wonderful World of Disney. After its run, the show was stuck at reruns on Saturday morning from 1964 to 1983 on the big three networks, until being revived in 1987 for new episodes of syndication. 
Even though the Jetsons would reappear in the 80s, their caveman counterparts, the Flintstones, were far more popular. Recently at an age where we're bombarded with clickbaity articles about the Simpsons predicting the future, one could argue that the Jetsons have predicted the future, as the technology seen in the cartoon has become our everyday devices, though sadly no flying car. Another cartoon in the 60s will make a bold departure from the funny animals and kid fare one would usually expect from Hanna-Barbera, and that show was Johnny Quest. This action series featured the globetrotting adventures of an 11-year-old Johnny Quest, the son of brilliant scientist Dr. Benny Quest, as they travel the world with bodyguard Ray Bannon, Johnny's best friend and adoptive brother Haji, and the Quest dog Bannon, as they battle villains all over the world, such as Dr. Zen. Hanna-Barbera originally wanted to make a show based upon a radio serial, Jack Armstrong, All-American Boy, but dropped the idea when they couldn't afford the rights. They approached New York comic book artist Doug Wildey to come up with an original action adventure cartoon. Both men were impressed with Doug's work, particularly after he was able to show them that the comic book look was entirely producible for TV. The new show drew many inspirations from Jackie Cooper and Frank Darrow movies, comics such as Terry and the Pirates, as well as Joe Barbera's fascination with the James Bond movie, Dr. No. The show also went through many name changes, such as the saga of Chip Ballou and Quest File 037, until finally settling on the adventures of Johnny Quest, Quest being a name he picked out of a phone book for his adventurous implications. Doug Wildey was involved in every aspect of Johnny Quest. He supervised the show, wrote most of the storylines, cast the voice actors, and designed the main cast, except for the dog Bandit, who was designed by Dick Bickenbotch. Originally, he objected to the idea of Bandit because he felt he was too cartoony for the type of show they were going for. But the character remained the show's comic relief to offset the many villains, mummies, and robot spiders. The character Haji was also memorable as it was the first time kids at home saw someone in a turban that wasn't a bad guy and he was just as smart and capable as his white co-stars. I know that doesn't excuse the other racist stereotypes, but yeah. Much like the Jetsons, Johnny Quest was also known for using futuristic technology. Doug specifically mentioned that he was always looking into the popular science magazines for hints of what might be, so he could adapt it into the Quest format of super high-tech mechanisms and vehicles that they would always have in those shows. Part of the fun for us kids was to see those kind of things. Johnny Quest was a, a plethora of fantastic vehicles. The BTOL jet, that was so cool at the time. I thought science fiction. I didn't think there was anything that was ever going to be like that. Young Johnny was voiced by then 16-year-old actor Tim Matheson. Jack Worms are agency. They represented actors for commercials and some voiceovers. They had a kids division. Jack sent me over there to Hanna-Barbera to audition. I'd never done anything like that. And it was just a, you know, boom in and out. And it, one of those things that just went away. I'd totally forgotten about it. You know, you'd just assume, well, I didn't get that. So that's the that goes, and you just move on. And then I called in, come on in and do it. And then I got an insight into what an industry it was and the wonderful storied history of Joe Barbera and Bill Hanna and what their contribution and significance was in the animation world. And I got a real sense of how hard it was. You know, Dawes Butler, June Ferre, Mel Blanc, Don Messick, Alan Freed, Mick Perrin, Nolan Sule, all these people that I was working with, they were like the pros from Dover. You know, they were these people that had a set of skills that I just couldn't imagine. They'd be recording the Flintstones or the Jetsons. I'd sit and watch how they did it. Then I'd go in and do Johnny, and they were more cartoon characters. But we were characters based in reality. Tim would go on to voice other HB leaning kid heroes, while his most famous role later on would be in a John Landis hit comedy, Animal House, and in an NBC drama, The West Wing. Haji was voiced by Danny Bravo, known for minor roles in films like The Magnificent Seven. Western star Mike Rode provided the voice of Race Bannon, while John Stevenson was the original voice of Betty Quest, before being replaced by Don Messick, who was also Bandit. The show's main villain, Dr. Zen, was voiced by Vic Perrin, who is best remembered as the control voice for the intro of The Outer Limits. While some additional voice talent were Kathy Lewis, who played Race Bannon's old girlfriend, Jade, and some of the minor characters and villains were provided by Doug Young, Key Luke, Sam Edwards, Jesse White, and Henry Corden, the second voice of Fred Flintstone. This is Johnny Quest, where gripping adventure stories explode to life with blazing realism. 
Watch as full living animation makes possible a new kind of excitement never before seen on television. And it will happen every time you enter the incredible world of Johnny Quest. Every week on ABC's Wide World of Entertainment. Johnny Quest debuted September 18th, 1964 on ABC in prime time. It was a huge success. However, it only lasted one season. But why? Simply put, it was way over budget. Keep in mind the animation in the show was a real game changer, and no other action cartoon looked like this. It's some of the animators at HB couldn't authentically draw or animate it in the old fashioned comic style, according to Doug Wildey. What I wanted was a moving comic strip with the blacks and shadow, and it became a matter of educating network people that creating and animating this kind of artwork didn't come cheap, because more artwork would be required and with much greater detail. These guys were used to drawing cartoon type characters, and they'd come in and they were at a loss. They couldn't handle adventure stuff. Boy did I get calls at night, from guys who somehow thought that they were failures simply because they couldn't handle something like this, which of course was crazy. But these guys would keep saying, I'm not really that much up on anatomy. I haven't had anatomy in quite a while. I can't seem to handle the... I mean, the artwork doesn't look right. And I'd look at it and say, yeah, it sure doesn't look right. It doesn't work. In the beginning, I was the only straight man in the entire organization that could draw a reasonably decent looking human figure. Also during this time, the Flintstones were beginning to lose viewers to the Munsters. And rather than cancel the show, the network switched time slots with Johnny Quest, which led to the Flintstones airing on Thursday nights. Starting in 1967, the show would air reruns on Saturday mornings, where it reached a new audience and gained massive popularity. The characters will be brought back in a short-lived 80s revival and a gritty 90s reboot, The Real Avengers of Johnny Quest. In 2015, the Quest crew will make an appearance in the Tom and Jerry directed video crossover film, Spy Quest. Despite its odd premise, the movie is pretty entertaining. It does a great job of bringing the world of Johnny Quest in the 21st century. In later years, Johnny Quest has been a major inspiration to most modern shows and movies. Director Brad Bird, a huge fan of the series, has gone on record saying that Johnny Quest was one of the influences of his film The Incredibles. The show would also be a subject of affectionate parody, like in the Adult Swim series, The Venture Bros. Given the quality of Johnny Quest, it's a standard set that's hard to meet up to in the time since. Johnny's place in cartoon history, um, in my opinion, is the best animated adventure show ever done. The 1960s was Hanna-Barbera's golden age. Many of their shows were hits among kids and adults, and their characters became pop culture icons overnight, with more and more cartoons added to the library. Be your hand, Joe, and I shall show you I am as strong as a hundred men. hundred men? I'm afraid I can't believe that. Here goes! I believe it, I believe it! Most notable competition around this time, be from the likes of Jay Ward animated comedies like the iconic Rocky Bullwinkle, to the primetime and Saturday morning fair from Format Films, Grand Trey Lawrence Animation, and House Singer Productions. Interestingly enough, the biggest animation giant, Walt Disney, was one of the few not interested in pursuing TV animation due to its low quality. After all, Walt was more preoccupied with his theme parks, TV shows, and feature films. The studio also experimented with live action animated fare like the Emmy winning special Jack and the Beanstalk, starring and directed by Gene Kelly, even theatrical films based on their properties like 1964's Hey There's Yogi Bear the first animated film based on a television series, and 1966's The Man Called Flintstone. A fun spoof of popular spy movies at the time, notably James Bond. However, not everyone was a fan. The studio was heavily criticized for its use of limited animation, even nicknamed the General Motors of Animation. Even Looney Tunes and Mary Melody's legend Chuck Jones dismissed the visual style as Illustrator Radio. Also in 1966, Hanna-Barbera's partnership with Screen Gems ended when the studio was sold as Taft Broadcasting for $12 million. The sale was delayed several months after Harry Cohen's family filed a lawsuit regarding the sale a few years earlier of his private stock of the company. HB was fully incorporated into Taft Broadcasting in 1968 and the company was focused primarily on Saturday morning cartoons, cutting back on its primetime productions and TV specials. And under Taft, the animation quality dropped lower. 
Simply put, there were too many shows to make and not enough people or time to do any quality work. Many of the veterans like Mike Maltese, Dan Gordon, Warren Foster, and Tony Benedict will soon be replaced by younger staff without the same level of experience and by international animation teams with even less experience. According to Tony Benedict, the selling out of the studio was no surprise. We all saw it coming. The influence of advertisers were everywhere. They brought in on the early creation of shows and Hanna-Barbera shows were just 30 minute commercials. No more funny shows. That's when I departed. Also, Screen Gem still owned the distribution and licensing rights to Hanna Barbera's previous properties under seven year contracts, and Taft couldn't touch the big money makers like Yogi Bear and the Flintstones until the early 70s, which is where we got stuff like Yogi's Gay and a new Fred and Barney show. The success of Johnny Quest, however, led to Hanna Barbera making more action cartoons, all of them from the mind of comic book legend Alex Toth. Shows like The Herculoids, The Birdman and the Galaxy Trio, The Fantastic Four, Dino Boy in the Lost Valley, and perhaps his most famous creation, Space Ghosts. These shows were huge hits on the Saturday morning lineup, which received an outstanding 60 share in the ratings. Six of the ten Saturday morning slots on CBS during the 1967 season were filled by superhero series from Hanna-Barbera. Though these action cartoons were a hit with audiences, Many parent groups thought the violence of the cartoons, as well as comics, was a bad influence on children. We'll get back to them. Which led to them being replaced by lighter fare, such as the Banana Splits and Wacky Races. The Banana Splits, who originally called the Banana Bunch, were presented to Hanna-Barbera by the Leo Burner Agency, in which Kellogg's was a sponsor an entire weekly hour of programming to NBC. However, they needed content. Hanna-Barbera approached them with something different. They made a show with their trademark funny talking animals, except this time instead of being animated, they'd be live action costume characters with real people in the suits, which confused the network and Leo Burnett when they showed the concept art, courtesy of Jerry Eisenberg and Ivo Takamoto, and told it would be live action and not animated. HB went on to pitch the show to Kellogg's, but Joe Barbera had an idea. He was going to pitch to them with a costume character in the room. Luckily, the studio had a Yogi Bear costume used for promotional appearances and Kellogg's were already familiar with Yogi since they sponsored the Yogi Bear show. The night before the pitch, Joe had the Yogi Bear costume quickly flown from California to Chicago, arriving just six hours before the meeting. As Joe Barbera was describing the banana splits, the Kellogg's chairman was falling asleep during the actual pitch portion of the presentation. But as soon as the costume Yogi Bear walked into the room worn by Jerry Eisenberg, it instantly caught everyone's attention. Jerry, as Yogi pranced in a room, shaking hands, patting the execs on the head, putting his arm around them and sitting on their laps. The executives were thrilled, and they helped them sell the show. William Hanna and Joseph Barbera approached puppeteer sibling duo Sid and Marty Croft to make the costumes for the four main characters. Joe Barbera called me one day and asked me, you know, if we, were, we knew we had people in suits and we did this. And, uh, and so that's when we built the banana splits, when after we built them, Marty looked at me and said, oh my God, you know, they're gonna make a fortune. Why did we do that? They had the concept oh, yeah. with Kellogg's of the banana splits. They came to us, you know, we, we, we added a bunch of creativity to the thing, and, but the, it was theirs. Sid and Marty themselves would later become a driving force at children's entertainment, creating many hit kids shows of the 70s, such as Land of the Lost, The Bugaloos, Wonderbug, Sigma and the Sea Monsters, and H.R. Puffer Stuff. The live action segments of the Banana Splits featured a band of four animals, Flegel, a dog performed by Jeff Winkless and voiced by Paul Winchell, Bingo, a gorilla performed by Terrence Winkless and voiced by Dawes Butler, Drooper, a lion voiced by Ann Rithrow and voiced by Alan Melvin, and Snorky, a mute elephant who communicates by honking performed by James Dove and Robert Towns and voiced by Don Messick. The segment drew much of his inspiration from Roland Martin's laughing, right down to the rapid fire comedic timing and sight gags. The show also drew inspiration from the then popular monkey sitcom Hey Hey It's the Monkeys. The outdoor scenes were shot on location on Six Flags over Texas at Arlington, Texas. The characters would drive around in their banana buggies, modified Epicat vehicles which were thought out by Joe Barbera 
as the senior demonstrated on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Other segments include Danger Island, a live action series reminiscent of Johnny Quest, directed by the late Richard Darner, who would go on to direct films such as Superman, Goonies, and a Lethal Weapon series. There were also animated segments featuring obscure cartoons such as The Three Musketeers and Arabian Nights. The show was a hit for NBC and had a good life of syndication. Many attempts at reviving the splits were rather short-lived. One notable comeback was his director video horror film by Sci-Fi. If you want to know my thoughts, it stinks. The show's iconic theme song, the Tra La La song, was written by Kellogg's jingle writer M.B. Wigglish Jr., who also wrote the Snap Crackle Pop theme for Rice Krispie Cereal, and has become more popular than the show itself, appearing in many top TV theme songs lists, covered by many artists, and peaked at number 96 on a Billboard Top 100. You might even hear it in the movie Kick-Ass. <laughs> Wacky Races would be a return to the broad, zany, cartoony humor. It featured 11 racers racing against each other all around the world. While all these races were memorable, such as Penelope Pit Stop, Pat Pending, and the Gruesome Twosome, the ones that steal the show are, of course, Dick Dastardly and Muttley, the main villains who try to cheat their way to the top, only to have their plans backfire, reminiscent of the antics of Wally e. Coyote. The show mainly took inspiration from the 1965 film The Great Race, it was originally supposed to be a part of a larger show made by Heather Quigley Productions, who also did Hollywood Squares. The first thing that I remember hearing about was the fact that we were to create all of these characters with their cars. Then each week, they would be involved in a, in a race. It was going to be more of a game where you had to send in who you thought was going to win the race every, every week or something like that. And then there would be prizes given away for kids that would pick the winner. It was more of a game show than anything else. And of course, uh, I, I think the powers that be stepped in and said, you can't do that. So anyway, it just became the show that it eventually evolved into. The show lasted for 17 episodes, but was successful in ratings. Penelope Pistop and Destiny and Muttley became breakout characters and each got their own spin-off show. A season or two later, Hanna-Barbera would do variations of this concept at later shows such as 1977's Laugh Olympics, 1985's Yogi's Treasure Hunt, and 1990's Fender Bender 500, both having Destiny and Mudley as the show's villains. In 2006, a pilot was pitched to Cartoon Network for a wacky race revival, featuring the kids of Penelope Pistop and Peter Perfect, as well as Destiny and Mudley back to their old tricks. The show was not successful, but in 2017, a reboot series aired on the Boomerang streaming services for two seasons. Going back to what I said about the parent groups, the now defunct Action for Children's Television was protesting to what they perceived as too much commercialism and violence in children's television. Their initial focus was the TV series Romper Room, which sold toy products to viewers. Then the next target was the Hanna-Barbera action cartoons, Space Ghost, Frankenstein Jr., and the Herculoids, which were all cancelled by 1969 due to pressure from paired watch groups. Even reruns like Johnny Quest and the Tom and Jerry shorts were heavily edited. This of course meant bad news for CBS executive Fred Silverman, who needed a new show fast, one that could keep his Saturday morning schedule steady and to satisfy the angry paired watch groups. He contacted William Hanna and Joseph Barbera about creating said show. What was it? Well, join me in the next video. When we last left off, we talked about how many of the Hanna-Barbera action cartoons that aired on Saturday mornings came under fire from paired watch groups like the now defunct Action for Children's Television. Pressuring networks to get rid of programming that may promote and incite violence in the real world. Which, funny enough, in the late 1960s, America was continuing to fight in the Vietnam War, serial killers were on the loose, and assassinations for presidential and civil rights figures were all too common. On top of that, many riots and protests were made in response to the injustice by the U.S. government and racial violence. This might sound familiar. Because of this, all these shows were canceled by 1968 and were replaced by comedic light affair. The big three networks, CBS in particular, were scrambling for the next big hit. 
a show that wasn't so violent, and that could be a mix of an adventure series like Johnny Quest and a comedic slapstick or one of Hanna-Barbera's funny animal cartoons. Luckily, help would arrive in the form of four teenagers and their meddling dog. The Archie Show, produced by Rival Filmation, made its debut on September 14, 1968, on CBS. The series was, of course, based on Bob Montana's long-running comic series, Archie. It features the misadventures of Archie Andrews and his teen pals, Betty, Veronica, Jughead, and Reggie. Oh, and to all you young viewers out there, the CW series Riverdale was based on these comics. I'm so over the toxic masculinity in this hallway right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. But the show's claim to fame was arguably spawning the chart topping hit, Sugar Sugar. sugar. Oh, honey, honey. The Archie show caught the attention of the late Fred Silverman, the head executive in charge of children's animation on CBS, who was looking to capitalize on his success. He contacted William Hanna and Joseph Barbera about possibly developing another show just like it and worked with them closely on the process. He wanted the show to be in the same vein as the 40s radio drama I Love a Mystery. Barbera would assign the task along to two storymen, the late Joe Ruby, a former Disney in-betweener, and Ken Spears, a friend of William Hanna's son. Ruby and Spears met in the editing department of Hanna Barbera and would both be moved off to writers, where they wrote scripts for the original Space Ghosts. Also joining their team was animation legend Iwo Takamoto, a former Disney animator who designed the main cast. The new show would be about the adventures of a teenage rock group called The Mysteries 5, not unlike The Archie Show. However, there is a twist. Each week, the kids would solve mysteries involving ghosts, monsters, werewolves, and other supernatural beings, where they were performing at gigs. The cast included five teens, Jeff, Mike, Kelly, Linda, and Linda's brother, W.W., along with their dog, Too Much, who played the bongos. And then Joe said, you know, man, Freddy likes dogs. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can put a dog in it, too. For too much, a big cowardly dog was chosen over a small feisty dog. However, the choices for the big dog were between a Great Dane and a Sheep Dog. The Great Dane would eventually be picked, but this raised concern that it'll be too much like the comic strip character, Marmaduke. But Barbera assured Ruby and Spears it wouldn't be a problem. When designing too much, Takamoto was consulted by a studio employee, who was a breeder of Great Danes. After learning what made surprise winning Great Dane, Iwo broke all the rules. And I selected about five things, I think, and uh, went in the opposite direction. For instance, a good, strong, straight back. So I sloped his back. A strong chin. So I underslung his chin. I lifted the eyes so that they became sort of human structured eyes and very heavy brows so the animators can use them to emphasize certain expressions. And I think a straight hind legs, I think she mentioned, so I bowed them. And I thought I could get a very funny duck waddle when he walked. Joe and Ken typed up a presentation for the show for Fred, but unfortunately, he wasn't impressed. And Fred says, uh don't like the dog, and get rid of the band. And uh, Fred hated the title. Hated the title of Mysteries 5. And it was like, you just saw that the, this, all this enthusiasm for the show was going right down the drain because you didn't have a title. And then finally, Fred says, you know, we talked about doing a show with Bob Denver, and it was going to be called Who's Scared? We all went, Great idea, Fred. That's a terrific title. And so 
it became Who's Scared. During the reworking of the show, the main cast were given new names and personalities. The five teenagers were reduced to four and are now known as Ronnie, who later became Fred, suggested by Silverman himself, Kelly became Daphne, Linda became Velma, and WW became Shaggy. The teens were now based on the characters from the 60s series, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, Dobie, Thalia, Zelda, and Maynarchi Krebs. By the way, if Maynard looks familiar to you, then that's because he's played by none other than our favorite castaway, Bob Gilligan Denver. In addition, the more scarier elements of the show were toned down to focus more on the comedy from Shaggy and Too Much. With this new pitch, the title had to be changed as well. When it was time to pitch the show to CBS for the fall season, there was a bit of a problem. When I went to present the idea to the top management of uh, CBS, along with the whole fall schedule, and bear in mind that's, that this program, Who's Scared, was the centerpiece of the whole show, and that without it, we really had no schedule. And I went up there, and Frank Stanton, who was president then, you know, a very somber man, said, that's too violent, we can't put that on the air. They were scared to death. They went, we can't put this on the air. It's too frightening for these kids. Every parent in America was going to call in and say, why are you giving my kid nightmares? So with that, Silverman have Joe and Ken tone down the show, and the comedy, as well as too much, were given center stage. In addition, the teenage rock group element was dropped. On a flight to a development meeting, Fred was inspired by a vocal scat line in Frank Sinatra's song, Strangers in the Night, and decided to rename the dog, Scooby-Doo. When the show, now titled Scooby-Doo Where Are You, was represented to the executives, it was approved, and the rest, as they say, was history. Mystery fans, hold on to your ghosts, because here come the spookiest, most spine-tingling tales ever to chill a boat. Watch Scooby-Doo Where Are You? Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? will make its debut on CBS Saturday morning, September 13th, 1969, following the perils of Penelope Pitstop. Originally, there were concerns that the show would be beaten out by ABC's The Hardy Boys, another mystery-solving show, but this one based on an established book series. But the show became a surprise hit. 65% of the Saturday morning audience, i.e. kids, were tuned in every week to see Scooby, Shaggy, Fred, Daphne, and Velma drive around in a mystery machine, solving capers involving supernatural forces, but end up being crooks in mass, who spout the famous line, Yes, might have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for these blasted kids and their dogs. The cast of Scooby-Doo feature five characters. Fred, the stalwart leader, who's voiced by young actor Frank Welker, in his first voiceover role that will lead to a successful career and is still voicing the character to this day. I wanted to do Shaggy because that was the funny part. And Casey Kasem, who was doing Shaggy, he wanted to do Freddy because it was more of a serious acting part. We ended up getting the exact opposite parts. I ended up with Freddy, he ended up with Shaggy, which he was fantastic at. How I came up with that voice was basically, it's my own voice with maybe five cups of coffee. You know, hey, would you do it for a Scooby snack? Oh gosh, well come on guys. Hey, I can drive because I have a license. Velma, the brainy analyst, was voiced by actress Nicole Jaffe who starred in the Elvis Presley film, The Trouble of Girls, with Frank. Daphne, the danger-prone beauty, was originally voiced by actress and singer Andrea Stefaniana Christopherson. Christopherson left the show after the first season to get married and move to New York. She was replaced by actress Heather North, who resumed the role until 1985, and briefly returned in 2003 along with Jaffe. Famed disc jockey and America Top 40 host, Casey Kasem, provide the voice of the oafish, hungry slacker, Shaggy. Well, when I auditioned for Shaggy, I knew they wanted a hippie. And I, I wasn't too good at doing a hippie. But they kept calling me back. And they called me back a third time and said I had the part. And the show's main star, the always hungry, always scared Scooby-Doo, was voiced by voice acting legend Don Messick, using a similar voice he used for Astro from the Jetsons. Roll Roy, right, Rogie Rouse. Scooby was said to be one of Don Messick's favorite roles, and you could definitely see why. He really does give life to this talking dog. Do I get a Scooby star? We'll look for one after we're off the camera here. Uh, okay. <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo. Hanna Barbera and CBS knew they had a hit on their hands, and the ratings were through the roof. According to Iwo Takamoto, None of us had any indication this was going to happen. All we knew is that our ratings numbers were tremendous. 
If we ever drop below a 50 or 60 share, Fred Silverman would have a fit. That's how successful the show was. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? concluded its run on 25 episodes on October 31st, 1970, with the episode Don't Fool with the Phantom. But this was far from the end. Two years later, a follow-up series, the new Scooby-Doo movies, would premiere on CBS. These hour-long episodes featured the gang solver mysteries with various guest stars, such as the Harlem Globetrotters, Sonny and Cher, Mama Cass, Three Stooges, Batman and Robin, etc. This version of the show lasted until 1974, and the network would continue to air reruns of the original series. In 1975, Fred Silverman would become the president of ABC, and decided to give Scooby and the gang a new home. When I moved to ABC, I, I guess the people at CBS didn't recognize how important Scooby was to the schedule, because they let the option expire. I, I just jumped on it. I said, buy it. Scooby will remain on ABC for the rest of his original Saturday morning run. Some episodes will introduce new characters, like Scooby's family members, such as Scooby Dumb and a more controversial Scrappy Doo. I've heard more pros and cons on on Scrappy. Uh, some people love him, and and others wonder why. 1985's 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo saw the gang team up with a warlock character based upon and voiced by horror legend Vincent Price to catch real supernatural creatures. But the results were disappointing. ABC canceled the show, ironically at the 13 episodes, and Scooby wasn't seen on a network for the next two years, until 1988, with the spin-off of Pup Named Scooby-Doo, a more Looney Tunes slash Tex Avery take on a babification trend going on at the time. Pup ended in 1991, and in the early 90s, Scooby-Doo had a very quiet hiatus, with reruns being shown on the USA Cartoon Express. However, all that changed in 1995, when the show moved to the then still new cable channel, Cartoon Network. The reruns attracted a new generation of fans, and became Cartoon Network's top rated show in 1997 and 1998. Scooby would later find his way to other Turner stations, where promotions and merchandise grew. 1998 saw the release of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Originally meant for theaters, this darker take of the original series was a huge success on home video at a time when Disney flooded the market with their cheap direct-to-video sequels. The success of Zombie Island would lead to more direct-to-video movies, as well as Scoob's return to Saturday morning for the first time in 17 years. What's new Scooby-Doo, a more 21st century take on a classic game, this will lead to more series, with the most recent being 2019's Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, along with several live action films, video games, toys, and more. 2020 saw the release of Scoob, a feature-length CGI animated film following the origin story of Scooby and the Gang. The film was meant to launch a shared Hanna-Barbera universe, which is now up in the air. I plan on going more into detail on this film in part 5, so I'll stop here. Today, Scooby-Doo has become one of the most popular and iconic cartoon characters of all time, and the only Hanna-Barbera property to survive after the studio and its founders met their end. With the many incarnations and tons of parodies and references, it cemented itself into pop culture. Why, it's Old Man Withers, the guy who runs the haunted amusement park. And I would have got away with it too, if it hadn't been for you snooping kid. While many have criticized the show for being formulaic, Others have praised its lovable characters, creepy and fun imagery, and innocent charm. The staying power of this franchise and its ability to adapt with the times is also very admirable. I've always been a huge fan, and it's been part of my life ever since I was a kid. I loved it back then, I love it now, and I hope to see more of Scooby-Doo and those meddling kids in the future. Scooby-Dooby-Doo! The success of Scooby-Doo led to Hanna-Barbera itself shamelessly capitalizing on it throughout the 70s. Many of these shows feature teenage detectives solving mysteries, usually with a pet or a mascot. 1970's Josie and the Pussycats, based loosely on the Archie comic series, featured a band of spy and mystery capers, usually involving mad scientists. 1971's Funky Phantom featured three teens and a revolutionary war-era ghost solving crimes. 1973's Speed Buggy featured three teens in a talking car, while 1976's Jabberjaw featured four teens in a talking shark, who sounds like Curly from the Three Stooges. As a rock band, foiling the plans of villains and evil scientists, 
which is made at the height of the Jaws craze. Scooby-Doo changed the rules for Saturday morning. Once that was established as a hit, that was the model and that was the template and an awful lot of shows started out with someone saying, okay, instead of four kids and a dog solving mysteries, let's have three kids and a cat or let's have four kids and a duck. These shows were perfect, but some of them like Josie and Jabberjaw certainly were entertaining. But others like Clue Club and Goober and the Ghost Chasers and Butch Cassidy, man, they weren't even trying. But not every cartoon Hanna-Barbera made in the 70s was a Scooby-Doo knockoff. Other shows during this period were Inch High Private Eye, Sea Lab 2020, The Harlem Globetrotters, Dynamut Dog Wonder, The Roman Holidays, and Hong Kong Fooey. The latter a parody of the Kung Fu martial arts craze at the time, and starring black actor and musician Scatman Crothers. We were doing a show called Hong Kong Fooey, and we were casting voices. We had to cast Hong Kong Fooey. So I brought in, let's say, an actor, and I had a script, and I did it, I did it with him. Then I brought in four other actors and did the same lines with four other actors. Then I brought in ABC, and they sat there, and I would hit the machine and play the five voices. And every time, the fourth voice got the big laugh. So we finally picked it. I didn't tell him who it was. It was a, a black man called Scatman Crothers. If you ever remember this man? He had a real sing-songy kind of a delirium. Well, he built who died, I believe it, who died. Who called in the ambulance, he'd say instead of ambulance, you know. So they loved it, and they screamed, but I never told them who it was until after they said, this is the one we want. Because if I had told them before we did the voices that this was the voice of a 71-year-old black man, they would have turned it down. They would have an opinion on it before they ever got to it. HB would also make shows based on licensed properties, as well as attempting to get back into prime time with the less successful Where's Huddles and Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, which was inspired by All in the Family and spun off from a segment in the anthology series Love American Style. Unfortunately, most shows ended up being affected from meddling from watch groups, like Action for Children's Television. Many of the violence and slapstick were toned down as some were forced to discuss social issues, most infamously the 1973 series Yogi's Gang, which featured the titular character and many classic HB regulars traveling the world in an arc confronting villains with not so subtle names like Mr. Bigot, the Envy Brothers, the Gossipy Witch of the West, and I Am Sloppy. Hanna-Barbera were even able to bring Bill and Joe's Tom and Jerry to Saturday mornings in an all-new revival. But because of television regulations, the cartoon violence the shorts were known for was not allowed. Instead, the two were non-violent friends who just kind of did stuff, resulting in a pretty boring show. The, the way they rationalize, they say anything that can be imitated by a child, we don't want to see. Therefore, you don't even throw pies in anybody's faces anymore. But, you know, I'll never forget going to one of the one of the pressure committees and saying, they, and I said, well, you know, I was raised on this kind of stuff. I was raised on this comedy, and it never hurt me. And they said, oh, yes, but look at the world today, they said. We've been sanitizing our stuff for years, but I don't see the world getting any better. <laughs> I mean, I don't see a... I don't see the children getting completely sanitized in any way. Children do what they want, but it isn't the cartoons that do it. What I hate to see is that I can't make them laugh the way I used to make them laugh. But Hanna-Barbera's other big hit during the decade was the Super Friends, which featured characters from DC Comics' Justice League of America. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, as well as new characters Hanna-Barbera created for the show. Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog, who are based from, well, take a wild guess. Interesting enough, this wasn't the first time the comic book characters made their way to Saturday mornings. Some of them appeared in shows created by rival Filmation. Not to mention Batman and Robin appearing twice in the new Scooby-Doo movies, and Superman and Wonder Woman appearing in an episode of The Brady Kids. Uh, it was the 70s, don't question it. Aaron for 16 episodes, the show was cancelled in 1974, but the boom of primetime superhero shows like Wonder Woman and a Six Million Dollar Man caused ABC to reconsider. In other words, shit, we gonna make some money with this. As a result, reruns of the first season were re-aired as a mid-season replacement, 
and was so popular it was revived under several different titles the next few years and introduced more and more DC Comics characters like Flash, Plastic Man, and Green Arrow while also introducing new superheroes Hanna-Barbera created like El Dorado, Apache Chief, Black Vulcan, and, Super Hulk. and most famously, the Wonder Twins. It was really important, I think, to get some diversity into the look of who you were seeing on television at the time. It's not so much that there wasn't ethnicity on Saturday morning animation, but it was sort of weirdly regimented. You, If you wanted to find black guys, you had to go look at Fat Albert. You had to go look at the Harlem Globetrotters, but you couldn't find any white guys there. I mean, you can't go through the 60s with the civil rights movement and, and, and the counterculture and all that and not be affected. The networks had come to the realization that they were serving a diverse population. And let's not forget... Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom... Not now! Okay. The show was a huge hit becoming one of the top-rated programs on Saturday mornings. Kids loved it, reminding them of the campy fun of the Adam West Batman series, and, and the writers and story editors at Hanna-Barbera enjoyed working on it. However, the editors of DC Comics were less than pleased with the show, as Iwutakamoto recalled, I never got so many irate letters about anything as those that came from the comic book staff regarding how we were handling the characters. There was a high degree of sarcasm to them, an underlying viciousness that sometimes got to the point of being X-rated. These people did not simply promote the comic book world, they lived in it. Periodically, I would gather these vindictive missives up and take them into the show writers and show them to them. The reply I usually got from them was no less blunt than the letters. Ah, tell them to go fuck themselves, they'd say. Today, of course, they could tell them that personally, since we are now a sister company of DC within the Warner Brothers corporate structure. Today, with the rise of much more well-received adaptations of DC Comics characters, the Super Friends has become a bit old hat, but it's fondly remembered by those who grew up with it. The 70s belonged to Hanna-Barbera. They dominated Saturday mornings, with many of their shows becoming hits on the big three networks. And they had very few competitors. Sure, there was the Patty Freeling and many TV specials, but their most notable rival during this period was... Filmation, founded by Norm Krebscott, Lou Scheimer, and Hal Sutherland in 1962. The studio had a few big hits under its belt, most notably Star Trek The Animated Series in 1973, which won the company an Emmy. They would lose their Saturday morning airtime on ABC to Hanna-Barbera after the failure of the short-lived Uncle Croc's Block, hosted by Charles Nelson Reilly. Though this wouldn't be the last we hear of Filmation in this video. Speaking of rivals, let's get back to Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. After the success of Scooby-Doo Where Are You, Joe and Ken would briefly leave Hanna-Barbera to become writers and producers at the Paddock Freely, working on shows such as The Barclays, The Houndcats, and Planet of the Apes, the animated series. They would briefly return to HB to become supervisors of many of the later Scooby-Doo episodes that aired on ABC. And speaking of ABC, Fred Silverman wanted to create competition to Hanna-Barbera when he became concerned they were putting quantity over quality. So with the financial backing from ABC, Joe and Ken set up Ruby and Spears Enterprises as a subsidiary of Filmways. Their first show was a Scooby-Doo ripoff with a twist, 1978's Fang Face. Throughout the 80s and 90s, they would create many shows on Saturday mornings, some with big hits, like Thunder the Barbarian, others existed. Also, Andy Hayward, the son of Hanna-Barbera Vice President Louis M. Hayward, would start out as an assistant to Joe Barbera, working on shows such as Scooby's All-Star Laugh Olympics. He would leave to start a little company called Deke. With tons and tons of new shows on the horizon, meant a heavier workload, and demand was more than the LA studio could handle. So they needed outside help. William Hanna would set up Hanna-Barbera Australia. Their first show was The Funky Phantom, as well as later episodes of the new Scooby-Doo movies was later reorganized as Southern Star slash Hanna-Barbera Australia and produced many CBS children's shows of the 80s and in 1988 would be sold to Disney to become, you know them, you love them, Walt Disney Animation Australia. HB would get production services from more outside studios such as Taiwanese Wang Film Productions, Phil Cartoons in the Philippines, and Japanese studio Mook Animation. But let's not forget one of Hanna-Barbera's biggest achievements during the decade, the 1973 animated theatrical film Charlotte's Web, based upon a book by E.B. White. Directed by Charles A. Nichols and Ibu Takamoto, 
and written by the Walden's creator, Earl Hammond Jr. The story, as many of you know already, features a pig named Wilbur, who befriends a literate spider named Charlotte, who advises a plan to keep him from being slaughtered by writing messages praising the young pig. There were several attempts to bring in a classic story to the big screen. One of the earliest was from the late Gene Deitch, the Czech animator whose early 60s Tom and Jerry shorts were discussed in part one. Now this fellow had done some artwork and it was the most gruesome, ugly artwork I've ever seen in my life. So he came in to us and showed us the artwork. I want to know if we were interested in doing it. So we got involved with Edgar Bronfman, the head of Seagram's, worth over 400 million a day, you know. And we got involved to do this. And it's a lovely story. And we cast it well, got a nice style of artwork. The Sherman brothers, who had just won Oscars for their work on Disney's Mary Poppins, were hired to write the songs. And Joe Barbera hired well-known character actors for voice talent, in addition to regulars Don Messick and John Stevenson. These include Henry Gibson as Wilbur, Rex Allen as the narrator, Agnes Moorhead as a goose, and the late Debbie Reynolds as Charlotte, which would become one of her most famous roles. Originally, Tony Randall was hired to play Templeton, the rat, but the directors felt he didn't quite have the raunchiness needed for the character, so he was replaced by comedian Paul Lynn. Lynn was no stranger to Hanna-Barbera, as he previously voiced the characters Mildew Wolf, Claude Pertwee, and the Hooded Claw. Charlotte's Web made its premiere at Radio City Music Hall on February 22, 1973, as released the theaters the following March. The film came out at a very interesting time for theatrical animation, a time when Disney, the king of animated features, were releasing less than memorable films without the leadership of Walt, who died seven years before, and cartoonist Ralph Bakshi was making a name for himself in adult animation, starting with Fritz the Cat, the first X-rated animated film. On top of that, Paramount Pictures, who haven't released an animated film since Mr. Bug Goes to Town, had no idea how to market the film. To Ibu Takamoto's surprise, the film will receive positive reviews from critics, including a glowing review from Time Magazine. William Hanna would also cite the film as one of his personal favorites. However, not everyone was a fan. Some criticized the film for its animation and the music, but the biggest critic of all would turn out to be the author of the original book, E.B. White. Despite consulting which parts of the story were to be kept in, he would write in a 1977 letter, We have never ceased to regret that your version of Charlotte's Web never got made. The Hanna-Barbera version has never pleased either of us. A travesty. The movie did moderate business at the box office, but constant TV airings and VHS releases would make the film a cult classic, spawning a directed video sequel and a live-action remake in 2006, which in recent years has become more well-known than the Hanna-Barbera film. Paramount and Hanna-Barbera would team up to create another animated film nine years later with Heidi Song, based on the children's fairy tale. Also during the 70s, Hanna-Barbera began experimenting with live-action films and specials. These include the infamous Kiss Meets the Phantom at the Park, the after-school special The Runaways, the feature film Chomps, and the Emmy-winning The Gathering. The latter featured Ed Asner as a man dying of cancer, tired of reconciling with his family for the holidays. This special struck a chord with Joe Barbera, as it reminded him of his own absent father. The only difference, according to Joe, the father of our story seeks reunion and reconciliation, whereas my old man simply made himself disappear. HB would also delve into variety shows, a popular staple of television at the time, with the Hanna-Barbera Happy Hour. By the end of the 70s, Hanna-Barbera became the largest producer of cartoons in the industry, but as the 80s was slowly approaching, all that was about to change. The 80s saw a rise of first-run syndicated cartoons. While cartoons were originally meant for the weekend, these shows were aired weekdays as children were coming home from school. Thanks to the action for children's television and the FCC, studios like Marvel, Sunbow, Reagan Bass, and Deke were all releasing animated shows based on licensed properties and popular toy lines. But perhaps the most famous show of this period that kickstarted the trend was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. 
the flagship show of Filmation and based on the Mattel toy line. On top of that, Disney, who had previously refused to venture into television animation due to the low quality, were now dipping their toes in the syndicated and Saturday morning cartoons with substantial budgets due to the push of then-CEO Michael Eisner. Starting off with shows like Bustles and The Adventures of the Gummy Bears exploding into popularity with DuckTales and many shows that would make up the Disney afternoon. Hanna-Barbera, no longer the kings of children's television animation like before, were attempting to stay afloat in the changing industry, with their control over children's programming going down from 80% to 20%. The studio continued to make more shows based on their most popular franchises and release their own cartoons based on celebrities and licensed properties, but none of them really took off. Unless you count... Smurfs, based on a classic successful Belgian comic by artist Peyo. It was about a society of tiny blue creatures led by Papa Smurf, who live in a Smurf village, and constantly under the threat of evil wizard Gargamel and his cat Azriel, whose plans always fail. In the late 70s, Stuart R. Ross would make an agreement with Peyo to market some Smurfs merchandise in the U.S., the huge success. So much so that Melissa Silverman, daughter of then president of NBC, Fred Silverman, had a Smurfette doll which caught the attention of her father, who thought it would be a good addition to the Saturday morning schedule, which at the time was going to be cancelled. And with that, he contacted Hanna-Barbera to commission the series. Vice President of Children's Programming at Hanna-Barbera, Margaret Loesch, was one of the developers of the series, and she recalls, Fred Silverman, then president of NBC, called and said, There's this property called the Smurfs. We've never heard of it. I sent one of my associates down the street, and he found Smurf keychains and toys and dumped them out on the conference table in Joe Barbera's office. Joe looked at them and said, All these little blue bastards look the same. I said, Aren't they cute? He said, It's your show. So I worked with Peo, I go to Brussels with my team, and he would come here. While we were developing it, our producer Gerard Baldwin was making a little sales clip for the merchandising people and for the affiliates meetings. When Fred, who loved the show, saw the clip, he said, we've got to change the music and add a laugh track. But we didn't change the music or add a laugh track. To this day, young people come up to me and say, I love the Smurfs and I love the music. I've also had people say to me, I'm so happy I didn't have canned laughter. Margaret would have a prominent career after leaving Hanna-Barbera. In 1984, she became president and CEO of Marvel Productions, and afterwards, she would run Fox Kids from 1990 to 1997, where she was responsible for buying and greenlighting X-Men and Power Rangers, both becoming monster hits. In the 2020s, she was the CEO and president of the now-defunct The Hub Network. Despite this, selling the show was not easy. And I had a lot of battles because one of the NBC people wanted to make them all different colors. They were trying to change it, you know. And I fought it and fought it. And I didn't think a half hour would do it, an hour should do it. And I had to go to New York and argue why it should be an hour instead of a half hour. The Smurfs made its debut on September 12, 1981. And the show not only became a hit, it became a phenomenon. The Smurfs became pop culture icons at the time, with merchandise through the roof, where it definitely became the Spongebob of its day. And much like Scooby-Doo, the success spawned several shows that were similar in concept. In addition to several primetime TV specials, the show won two Emmy Awards and became one of the longest running Saturday morning cartoons in history, ending in 1990 with a total of 256 episodes. Today the Smurfs have made a bit of a comeback, thanks to the live action Sony films of the 2010s, plus an all-CGI reboot, as well as a new Nickelodeon show on the way. As stated before, Hanna-Barbera's other shows during this period came and went, but also several legends from the Golden Age animation were now working at HB, such as Tex Avery and Fritz Freeling. Tex, who at the time was mostly doing commercial work, was Bill Hanna's mentor at NGM, and Hanna was more than happy to help out an old friend. He developed the short-lived The Quickie Koala Show, in 1980, which would, unfortunately, be the last thing he worked on before dying of cancer that same year. Freeling was a consultant of Pink Panther and Sons, one of the many shows capitalizing on the Muppet Babies. 
Later shows would include the Flintstone Kids and a pup named Scooby-Doo. Meanwhile, financially struggling Taft Broadcasting, owner of Hanna-Barbera, was folded into Great America Broadcasting. While Joe was busy pitching and selling ideas, one of which was animated Bible tales called Greatest Adventures. This wouldn't be for television, but for the brand new direct -to video market. The series became a success on home video, despite rejection and skepticism Joe initially faced from backers. In 1989, animator Tom Ruger, who was a producer of Pup Named Scooby-Doo, was given a call to help resurrect Warner Brothers Animation Department. At that time, my ex-boss from Hanna-Barbera, Gene McCurdy, was the executive in charge over there at Warner Brothers Animation. She came to me one afternoon in January 1989 and said, Hey, Steven Spielberg wants to make a cartoon series over here at Warner Brothers. It's called Tiny Toons, the spelling would be changed later, and other than that, we really don't know much about it, except that it will probably feature junior versions of Bugs and Daffy. Would you want to come over and produce it? I said never. <laughs> no, I immediately said yes. That was a Monday. On Tuesday, I went into Hanna-Barbera. I went to Bill and Joe separately and said, there's an opportunity to make a show with Spielberg. And they were great and supportive. I was under contract, so they could have said no. But they let me out of my contract, and I was gone that day. Tom and many of HB staff would move to Warner Brothers to develop hip animated programs, such as Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, and Freakazoid. Also that same year, TNT aired a Yabba Dabba Doo celebration, 50 Years of Hanna-Barbera, a star-studded special hosted by Tony Danza and Andy Potts, a look back of the past 50 years of William Hanna and Joseph Barbera's partnership into animation. Great America's takeover would mean many changes to the studio. The much older Bill and Joe would still be heads of the company, but would have to take orders from others. And Joe wasn't exactly thrilled about it either. The takeover would bring in the new leader. Enter David Kirshner. David started out as an illustrator for Jim Henson, which led to him creating the popular children's book series, Rules Petal Place. Though his biggest contribution to film would be creating and executive producing the Spielberg Don Bluth collab. An American Tale, and the horror franchise, Child's Play. David had big plans for the studio by reintroducing successful classic characters to new audiences and making the studio attractive to buyers. In his first year, he had gotten more shows on the air than what the studio had done five years prior. Our goal is to show the industry that we are a player. It's time to get in there and show what we can do. Disney has done it, and we are following in their footsteps. Kirshner and Hanna-Barbera also planned many feature films for the studio. Some like a live-action Scooby-Doo film to be made by Universal went through development hell, a live-action Curious George movie, and a Sally Field vehicle, a police psychological drama, Conundrum, that never got off the ground. In addition to opening the family film division, Bedrock Production, which produced a TV special, Dreamer of Oz, and the infamous failed TV pilot, Puczynski. What are you going to do now? Well, first I'm going to try licking myself, and then I'm going to catch my killer. What the fuck? Bedrock Productions would also co-produce a TV pilot for NBC in 1990, starring comedian Rodney Dangerfield, fresh off a hit film such as Caddyshack, Easy Money, and Back to School. It featured a high school kid that could summon his favorite comedian, a.k.a. Rodney Dangerfield, whenever he needs help. The pilot was aptly titled, Where's Rodney? Where's Rodney? What a childhood I had. My mother breastfed me through a straw. Where's Rodney? Well, my old man took me to the zoo. They thanked her for returning me. Where's Rodney? Now, last week I looked up my family tree. Two dogs were using it. That's the story of my life. No respect. It wasn't picked up. David also created some of these shows, like Wake, Rattle, and Roll, Rick Moranis and Gravedale High, and a cult classic, Pirates of Dark Water, debuting on ABC in 1991. The show featured a young prince and his gang of misfits trying to find the lost 13 treasures of rule before the evil pirate Bloff gets to it first. The show is very entertaining, and I definitely recommend checking it out. David also tried to get the studio back into prime time due to the runaway success of The Simpsons, but the results were disappointing with noble efforts like CBS's Fist Police and ABC's Capital Critters being quickly canceled. Bill Hanna enjoyed working with David It was more than happy to help out, lending his voice as a narrator for the TV special The Last Halloween 
and directing the Flintstones special, I Yabba Dabba Doo. Joe, however, wasn't quite as happy with giving up creative control as he and David butted heads over direction of the company, and he wasn't fond of most of David's ideas, except for a few like Tom and Jerry kids. 1990 would be a big year for Hanna-Barbera. Universal would briefly own a rights to the library and develop a simulator ride at their then new theme park, Universal Studios Florida. You're not gonna believe where I've just been! Universal Studios Florida, where they have a fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera ride, well that's a chase! It's not a chase that you watch, but you're in it! And there's only one place you'll find it, in Orlando! Fantastic world of Hanna Barbera at Universal Studios Florida. One of the park's original attractions, it was the only one to run smoothly on opening day, and I was fortunate enough to ride it the last year it opened. It would later be replaced by a similar Nickelodeon attraction, Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast, which in turn would be replaced by a Despicable Me ride. There was also the theatrical Jetsons the Movie, which was in production before Kirshner took over. Notable for being the last project of Mel Blanc and George O'Hanlon, who died during recording, the movie was a critical and financial failure, and ended up grossing just $20.3 million in the U.S. One notable controversy was the casting of pop star Tiffany in the role of Judy Jetson, which greatly upset the cast and crew, and especially Judy's original actress, the late Janet Waldo. I was totally crushed. I originated the character, and I feel very sentimental about Judy. If they had recast the whole show, there wouldn't have been any problem at all. But the fact that my part was the only one that was changed just threw me. I felt it was very disloyal of Hannah and Barbara. I don't like to badmouth Hannah Barbara because they've been very good to me and I've been told that this is just a one-shot thing. But this Judy incident just hurt my feelings. In 1991, Great America would soon find a buyer, which was none other than media mogul Ted Turner. Turner, who had success in creating news network CNN and cable channels such as TBS and TNT, had acquired the rights to the MGM Animation Library, the pre-1948 Looney Tunes slash Mary Melody shorts, and the Fleischer slash Famous Studios era Popeye shorts. He was also no stranger to television animation, as he created the campy environmentalist superhero series Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Ted's company, Turner Entertainment, would buy the entire Hanna-Barbera and Ruby Spears Library for $320 million, outbidding Hallmark Cards and MCA, parent company of Universal Studios. We are pleased to be one step closer to obtaining the world's finest animation library. The Hanna-Barbera acquisition is in keeping with Turner Broadcasting's continuing efforts to bring our viewers the highest quality entertainment programming. With all these animated properties in his possession, Turner had big plans. He wanted to create a cable channel that showed cartoons 24 hours a day. Eh, it could work. Let's go back for a minute to the year 1992. Bill Clinton won the presidential election, becoming the 42nd president of the United States. Grunge fashion hits the scene. The largest mall in the world, Mall of America, opens its doors in Bloomington, Minnesota. Euro Disneyland opens in Paris and becomes one of the most infamous theme park failures in history and we see the introductions of Crystal Pepsi, Todd McFarlane's Spawn comic, Madonna's sex book, the video phone, and the first smartphone. Notable news events include George H.W. Bush pardoning former Secretary of Defense Kaspar Weinberger and five others that were involved in the Iran-Contra affair. Serial killer and heartthrob Jeffrey Dahmer is sentenced to prison. U.S. Supreme Court reaffirms the rights to abortion, and the L.A. riots following the acquittal of police officers responsible for the beating of Rodney King. On the music scene, we saw the rise of Arrested Development, Billy Ray Cyrus, Sir Mix-a-Lot, and Criss Cross with their hit single, Jump. And Whitney Houston breaks records with her cover of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You, which spent 14 weeks on a Billboard Hot 100 for the movie The Bodyguard. Speaking of which, Popular movies this year include Basic Instinct, Sister Act, Wayne's World, Batman Returns, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, and Disney's Aladdin was the highest grossing film that year. While in video games, we saw the debuts of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Street Fighter 2, Super Mario Kart, 
in Mortal Kombat. In the television, Sinead O'Connor becomes a controversial figure at the ripping of a picture of the Pope on SNL. Johnny Carson ended his run on Tonight Show, and we saw the debut of hits like Batman the Animated Series, X-Men, Mad About You, Martin, MTV's The Real World, and the Sci-Fi Channel. Also, everyone's favorite purple dinosaur, Barney, would skyrocket to stardom with the debut of his hit PBS show, Barney and Friends. As far as animation goes, while Fox's The Simpsons continued to dominate primetime with many trying and failing to get a piece of the pie, there was a slow decline on Saturday morning. Most notably, NBC got rid of animation altogether on their Saturday morning lineup in favor of tween-oriented sitcoms due to the success of Saved by the Bell. While newcomers Fox Kids and the Disney at the Noon lineup will be a force to be reckoned with on weekday afternoon. Of course, Nickelodeon had their oh-so-popular Nicktoons brand, but at the time, there were only three shows, Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy. Billionaire Ted Turner, who had just bought the Hanna-Barbera library for $320 million, and previously the MGM and the pre-1948 Warner Brothers cartoons, had an idea for a network that could show cartoons 24 hours a day. A cartoon network, if you will. Okay, play this! <laughs> Alright, alright. Oh, do I look? Fred! Come on, Olive. Ready? Ready. Take it from the top. Okay, boys. A one, a two. Yogi Bear is smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear is always in the ranger's hair. On October 1st, 1992, Turner launched the Cartoon Network. At the time, the idea of a network that showed cartoons all day every day was a pretty risky move. No one ever attempted something like this before. Imagine, no sitcoms, no game shows, no talk shows, just cartoons. What you're seeing right now is a presentation pitch made by Turner to convince potential investors to buy. Will people tune in and all Cartoon Network? Sure. Right now, ratings are consistently strong on all cable cartoon shows. Wherever and whenever tunes run on cable, they perform well. The channel will be heavily promoted in print ads as well as other Turner stations like TBS and TNT. On its first day, the channel aired catalog owned by Turner Broadcasting, such as MGM, Warner Brothers, Ruby Spears, and of course, Hanna-Barbera Productions. Introducing them to a new generation of viewers, the channel launched with a special event called Droopy's Guide to Cartoon Network, hosted by MGM favorite Droopy. And the first cartoon to ever air on the network was the Bugs Bunny short, Rhapsody Rabbit. Notable programming blocks include Toon Heads, an anthology series discussing trivia about cartoons from the golden age of animation, Down with Droopy D, Super Adventures, a block featuring 60s Hanna-Barbera action cartoons, and Bugs and Daffy Tonight, a block featuring classic Looney Tunes shorts, Turner owned for the pre-1948 AAAP package. There are also innovative programs, such as 1993's The Moxie Show, yet another anthology series featuring classic cartoons hosted by the first CG real-time cartoon character, and 1994's Space Goes Coast to Coast, the 60s Hanna-Barbera superhero revamped as a talk show host. Cartoon Network will require high ratings it would be added to more and more cable systems, and by 1994, it became the fifth most popular cable channel in the U.S. Now before we go any further, I would like to give recognition to someone who deserves just as much credit for CN as Ted Turner. Enter founder Betty Cohen. Cohen was the former director of marketing at TNT at its launch, responsible for their programming and promotion department. She also launched the NFL and NBA packages, 
which became very popular with male audiences. Impressed, Turner put her in charge in the creation of the Cartoon Network. She would be responsible for many highlights of the network's golden age, including the Cartoon Cartoons brand, Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, Toonami, Adult Swim, and CartoonNetwork.com. She was stepped down due to creative differences in 2001. I never said just cable network. I never said kids network. I said world and I said brand. I defined the vision broader. You become as big or as small as you define your future. In addition to their cartoons being the core contributor to Cartoon Network, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera were the creative consultants for the channel, as well as serving on the network's advisory board, which is founded by head of programming Mike Laszlo, along with Fritz Freeling, Ren and Stimpy creator John Kay, and veteran voice actor Don Messick. Their studio will continue to make animated programs for Saturday morning, such as a revival of The Addams Family, capitalizing the success of the previous year's Barry Sonnefeld film, as well as several television specials and take over production of the final season of Deke's Captain Planet with the new Avengers of Captain Planet. Captain Planet, he's the man, leading the Chargers number one fan. Check him out, you're gonna see. He's the Mega Mac Daddy of Ecology. Captain the Hero with the Gungeon. Meanwhile, Turner knew it needed a fresh creative talent to help them get their new cable channel off the ground and revive the reputation of the once dominant Hanna Barbera Productions. So, President Scott Sasa hired Fred Siebert to become the new president of Hanna Barbera. In theory, this seemed like a good idea. After all, this was the same man responsible for the branding of MTV at its launch and was one of the people responsible for the I Want My MTV campaign. He would then help resurrect the low-rated Nickelodeon in the mid-1980s, getting them first to the ratings in six months and launching Dick and Knight. There was just one problem. I've never, I, have, I know nothing about cartoons. He goes, oh, you do all those logos for Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. and I said, that's 10 seconds of wiggling the logo, and I hire animators to do that. I don't know anything about that. I've never seen a storyboard, I've never read an animation script. I said, look, it couldn't get worse. So um, uh, Alan and I um, uh, decided to close Fred Allen. Mm -hmm. um, so I took the job. I arrived in June of 1992 to three or 400 employees who had no idea what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, I had no idea what I was doing there. I was scared to death. Mm -hmm. They sit me down in what had been Bill Hanna's office, and they had now said, was my office. And I'm like, well, doesn't Bill want this office? No, he wants to be as far away from me. He, he had a like, little office on the third floor. Mm -hmm. He was 82 years old. Right across the hall was Joe Barbera. They were both signed for life as consultants to the studio. You know, th this is a really tough position to be in. Here were these two men who had basically been part of inventing the cartoon business as we knew it. Not just television, but in all their years doing Tom and Jerry at the MGM studio and stuff. They were truly part of the innovation that created the animation business. But it was clear that they had lost the mojo in terms of what to do for the contemporary sure. market. Yeah. So I had to quietly back out of Joe's office, you know, sort of nodding my head, going, great idea, Joe, and like, you know, go back to my office and be freaked out. Meanwhile, a young Cal Arts graduate, Donovan Cook, would pitch a show to Hanna-Barbera about two dogs which he based on two stray dogs who were roaming around his apartment. This would result in... Two Stupid Dogs, which featured the adventures of a small dog aptly named Little Dog and his best friend, a large sheep dog named Big Dog. As they get in trouble in situations involving drive-ins, space shuttles, post offices, and more. While he was working at Spumco on a Ren and Stimpy show, Donovan pitched the show everywhere, but it was Hanna-Barbera that took interest in it. So we pitched all around and Hanna-Barbera was one of the last places. Hanna-Barbera happened to be making Tom and Jerry kids short cartoons, so when I took the show to Warner Brothers or Fox TV, or a lot of those places, they would say, yeah, it looks like it would be funny, but they're shorts. What do you do with them? 
I would be, well, you put three of them together and you get half hour. I mean, that's how we watched Looney Tunes, so it was a little weird that so many television and production executives wouldn't really know what to do with it, but at Hanna-Barbera, they were making these Tom and Jerry kids shorts, so they immediately knew how to put shorts on television, and I pitched to Margot McDonough, who was the creative executive there at the time, and she got it and liked it. The crazy thing is this got pitched on a Tuesday, and on Thursday, Turner took over the company, so there was quite a bit of turmoil and it took quite a long time to make the deal because they were interested and liked it, but for months they had no idea who was going to run the company. David Kirshner was running Hanna-Barbera at the time, but they had no idea who was going to run it and finally they found Fred Siebert, but it then was months before he came to California to take over, so it was a long, drawn-out process as it often is, but it all worked out in the end. In addition, the show was accompanied by an updated version of the 60s Hanna-Barbera classic, Secret Squirrel, titled Super Secret Squirrel. Fred Siebert asked Donovan to choose a classic studio cartoon to revive the main show, Two Stupid Dogs. Reason? It was one of Cook's favorite HB cartoons growing up. The show debuted on September 11, 1993, as part of his TBS Superstation's Sunday morning in front of the TV block become Hanna-Barbera's first bona fide hit since the Smurfs, and ran until 1995. The show had an art style reminiscent of early HB favorites, such as Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear, with its thick outline limited look that would be imitated in many following cartoons from the mid-90s to the 2000s. Perhaps the show's biggest claim to fame is a who's who of future well-known animators that got their start working on the series. Aside from the already notable John Kay, who had recently got fired from his own show at Nickelodeon, came aboard the series to add what he would call tidbits of poor tastes for the show's memorable Red episodes. Notable folks include designers Mike Moon and Paul Rudish, storyboard artists such as Conrad Verdon and Andrew Stanton, who would become big names at DreamWorks and Pixar respectively, and the writing directing team Tony Gregg and Bob Skaneway who would go on to make hit shows for Disney TV animation, like The Lion King's Timon and Pumbaa, 101 Dalmatians the series, Mickey Mouse Works, and The House of Mouse. As for Donovan, after Dogs, he would go to develop Nightmare Ned for Disney, and co-direct the 2002 film Return to Neverland, and a straight-to-video feature, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, Three Musketeers. There were other crew members that helped play a role in the resurrection of Hanna-Barbera and the rise of Cartoon Network, but we'll get to him later. Right now, let's talk about another hit that would differ from Hanna-Barbera's usual style. Enter SWAT Cats, the Radical Squadron. Set in the fictional anthropomorphic town of Mega Cat City, the show featured two vigilantes, former law enforcers Jake Razor Clausen and Chance T-Bone Furlong, as they saved their town for the Villain of the Week. The series was a brainchild of brothers Christian and Yvonne Tremblay, who developed the idea years before it became a series. They pitched out several different animation studios who might be interested, and it was Hanna-Barbera that took a chance of the two young artists. Being there at Hanna-Barbera studio, just being there and doing a production, it was, it was the most amazing thing, and um, it's, it's something that we didn't take for granted Joe Barbera and William Anna had invented the medium. They had invented the medium of simplicity with very limited animation. But because of that, they have created a new genre. They had to focus on personalities and characters. And because the medium was television, and in television the most important aspect is you have very strong personality and characters that you can identify with, they had invented that medium for television and animation. And Joe Barbera and William Anna being actually at the studio in their offices and they would come around and we would, we would, we would stop by, we would talk, uh, we'd see them. Just that is, is when I think about it again, is, was such a privilege that uh, it's one of the greatest memory. The show aired for two seasons, simultaneously in syndication and on TBS this Sunday morning in front of the TV block. It was a hit with the kid audience, becoming the number one syndicated animated show of 1994. The success of the show led to merchandise, including action figures and a Super NES video game. Sadly, 
the show would come under fire due to criticisms of its violence. We have more cartoons than anybody. The Flintstones, the Jetsons, the Smurfs, Scooby-Doo, they're non-violent. We don't have to worry about that we're encouraging kids to kill each other like some other cartoon programs do. Though this was directed at shows like Beavis and Butthead, which had violence that could be imitated by young children, such as the infamous Fire episode. And with that, the show was cancelled with three unfinished episodes, but gained a second life when reruns aired on Cartoon Network, and developed a cult following. Since the 2010s, there have been talks of a Swatcast revival, Swatcast Revolution, with a highly publicized Kickstarter that became a success. Will we ever see T-Bone and Razor again? Time will only tell- Oh. Well, never mind. 1993 saw the return of Bill and Joe's Tom and Jerry on a big screen, and Tom and Jerry the movie. Because of Hanna-Barbera's workload, their studio would not make the film, instead the duties being handled to animator Phil Roman by his studio Film Roman, who was at the time known for producing many Garfield specials and Joseph Barbera was a creative consultant. The movie saw Tom and Jerry becoming friends and helping an orphan girl escape her cruel aunt and find her father. The movie was notable for having original music by the famed Henry Mancini and would be one of the last productions he worked on before he died. Critics were not impressed by the film and it was a bomb at the box office. Most of the criticism was directed at the titular duo talking. William Hanna would co-produce the 20th Century Fox film once a pot of forest with David Kirshner. Originally titled The Endangered, the movie was an environmental tale of three young animals, or furlings as they're called, on a quest to find a cure for their sick friend who was poisoned by chemical fumes. Despite its poor reception, Hannah was proud of the work the studio did. It is the finest feature production we have ever done. When I stood up and presented it to the studio, my eyes teared up. It is very, very heartwarming. In 1993, filming began on a live-action adaptation of The Flintstones, produced by Steven Spielberg, directed by Brian Levant, and starring John Goodman as Fred Flintstone, Elizabeth Perkins as Wilma, Rick Moranis as Barney, and Rosie O'Donnell as Betty, along with Kyle McLaughlin and newcomer Halle Berry as the antagonist. The film was released by Universal Pictures on May 27, 1994, to negative reviews who criticized the story in adult tone but the visual effects, sets, and performances, particularly Goodman as Fred Flintstone, were praised. The movie was also heavily promoted and ended up earning $342 million worldwide. Later that same year, Hanna-Barbera would team up with David Kirshner and a newly formed Turner Feature Animation to co-produce the Macaulay Culkin vehicle, The Page Master. Kirshner would produce and co-write the script. The movie ended up being a critical and financial bomb, but would gain a small following in recent years. Of course, the channel can't survive on reruns alone. So with that, Turner and Hanna-Barbera decided to focus their attention on original programming for Cartoon Network, canceling several projects based on their classic characters. Fred Seibert and Hanna-Barbera would come up with an idea that would become the blueprint of many popular cartoons of the 90s and 2000s. That idea would be world premiere tunes, aka what a cartoon. The concept would be a throwback to the golden age of animation, where many artists and animators, most from HB staff, would create 48 7 minute shorts that were similar in structure to theatrical cartoons. Ones that were well received would spin off to their own series on Cartoon Network, and the best part, full creative control was given to the artists, and creators with no executive interference. The idea was brilliant, as well as innovative, and while there were similar ideas before, like liquid television, world premiere tunes were far more popular. We didn't care what the sitcom trends were, what the Galadian was doing, what the sales departments wanted, we wanted cartoons. Since What a Cartoon was essentially a love letter to the golden age of animation, Seymour was taught by legends such as William Hanna, Joseph Barbera, and famed Looney Tunes director Fritz Freeling who showed him how animated shorts back then were made. John Crickfalusi was also one of the first people Fred approached was searching for new talent. Said new talent consisted of young animators who pitched their ideas to Fred and the studio, many of whom were CalArts graduates who did previous work for Hanna-Barbera, such as Gendy Tartakovsky, Greg McCracken, Butch Hartman, 
newcomer Van Particle, Rob Rossetti, Pat Ventura, and David Feist. Animators with in and out the studio begin to pitch ideas, such as longtime veterans Jerry Eisenberg, Don Jurich, Bruno Brosetto, and Ralph Bakshi. Hanna Barbera founders and chairman William Hanna and Joseph Barbera even got in on the act and directed several shorts separately. Bill will create the shorts Hard Luck Duck and Wind Up Wolf. Both will be the last cartoons he would direct, while Joe would write and direct a couple of shorts centering on the Flintstones character Dino. Don't miss this! this. World premiere Toons, a brand new cartoon every single week, created by some major Toon talents, like Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, the guys who brought you the Stones, the Jetsons, and Scooby-Doo. Then there's heavyweights like Ralph Bakshi, creator of Cool World, and new guys like Craig McCracken, who's making his first Toon ever. The top Toon talent on the planet is coming together to make World premiere Toons. Catch the very first one on Monday, February 20th at 8 p.m., only on Woo. the Cartoon Network. World Premiere Toons made its debut February 20th, 1995 during a Space Ghost Coast to Coast special, President's Day Nightmare, where many of the short's creators made an appearance. The first short to ever air was Greg McCracken's Powerpuff Girls and Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins, in which three kindergartners with superpowers saved their town from the villainous Fuzzy Lumpkins, a hillbilly adventure creature who turns the whole city into meat. The shorts were air every Sunday, preceding the Mr. Spins Cartoon Theater block, and would be promoted heavily on Cartoon Network and the other Turner stations. Some of the shorts were even featured as bonus cartoons on the VHS releases of more classic Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Notable shorts include two Georgia Jr. cartoons, a Ren and stippy s update of the classic MGM characters, No Tip, about a pizza boy trying to deliver a pizza in Antarctica, the Academy Award-nominated Chicken from Outer Space, while a small dog named Courage tries to stop an alien chicken from taking over the Earth, and Shake and Flick, a short about a flea and a poodle one-upping each other. Another short, Larry and Steve, will be created by a newcomer to Hanna-Barbera, a Rhode Island School of Design graduate, who based the short on a student film, Life of Larry. He would continue with the studio as a writer and storyboard artist, the newcomer was Seth MacFarlane. The original run of Wonder Cartoon would end in November 1997, but would be revived under several different monikers with new shorts and new talent. In 1995, Hanna-Barbera would release Dumb and Dumber on ABC based on the hit Jim Carrey film. It would be the last Hanna-Barbera cartoon to air on Saturday mornings on broadcast network television. At this time, Turner started focusing on original programming for their channel resulting in Cartoon Network's earliest hits in Hanna-Barbera's Swan Song. You know, I'm addicted to cartoons. It's very, you know, I should check into the Betty Boop Wing. It's like, <laughs> I mean, there's, have you seen Johnny Bravo, that great cartoon? No, I haven't. Oh, not. it's like Elvis on steroids. It's like my pretty lady. Really? Oh, it's, is it on now? or is it It's on uh, Cartoon Network, oh, probably as we speak. But And another wonderful cartoon called Dexter. Have you seen that? No. Cow and Chicken? I have not. Well, so we'll have to get you. But I do remember. We'll start you slow, girl. <laughs> The first short that became a series was Dexter's Laboratory. The show follows a boy genius who has a secret laboratory in his room where he hides from his parents. He constantly gets himself into trouble due to his inventions and his older sister Dee Dee interfering. The show had other segments such as Dial F for Monkey where Dexter's pet monkey leads a double life as a crime fighting superhero and The Justice Friends which parodies of Marvel superheroes lived together in an apartment in a satire of sitcoms. Series creator Jenny Tartakovsky based Dexter and Dee Dee on a sibling relationship with his older brother Alex, where Tartakovsky pestered Alex as kids. The characters will first appear in a short film he created while studying animation at CalArts. The show had a university screening for the producers of Batman the Animated Series who hired Jenny right out of college. Gendy later got a job at Hanna-Barbera working on Two Stupid Dogs, where he first met future collaborators Craig McCracken, Paul Rudish, and Rob Rossetti. With time to pitch to What a Cartoon, Gendy reworked his student film and the characters to who we know now as Dexter and Dee Dee. One of our producers had seen Gendy's student film and said, you should pitch that as a short. They wanted something newer and different, so they were trying all these creator-driven cartoons. Basically what ended up happening is 
me, Gendy, and Paul Rudish. We all three produced that Dexter short together. Change is premiered as the second short of world premiere Tunes on February 26, 1995, and will receive positive reception for viewers. It was even nominated for an Emmy. Hey, check out the buzz on Dexter's Laboratory. I like the cartoon because it's about a scientist that likes science. It was really cool. The music was awesome. The characters were cool. I liked the little girl. Her voice was great. The colors were great. The animation was great. It was funny and crazy. I liked your cartoon because I thought it was funny and cute. Thank you for letting me call in. It was really cute. It was child-oriented. And we want more. The show premiered April 28th. 1996 on TNT and the next day on Cartoon Network and TBS, becoming a huge hit. Critics and audiences praised the show for its humor, characters, and innovative animation style that harkens back to the older Hanna-Barbera, UPA cartoons, and Japanese anime. Even Betty Cohen would name the show as one of her favorite cartoons. Dexter's Lab was one of the network's highest rated series for years and even spawned merchandise such as toys, video games, albums, comics. He even made an appearance at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The show originally ended in 1998, but would return the following year in a TV movie's finale, Ego Trip, where Dexter uses a time machine to save the future. Popular demand would lead to two more seasons without Jenny's involvement, and ending in 2003. Dexter's Lab remains one of the Cartoon Network's best shows not only did it usher a new renaissance in the Hanna-Barbera and CN's history, but it's important to television and animation in general. <music> Though not as often as before, Hanna-Barbera was still able to revisit their most classic characters in some revivals. Cave Kids, a spin-off of the Flintstones, focused on the imaginative adventures of babies Pebbles and Bam Bam, along with Dino. Despite aiming for younger audiences, the show only lasted for 8 episodes and would fall into obscurity. The anticipated Johnny Quest revival, The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest, featured a slightly older version of the characters embarking on globetrotting adventures investigating mysterious phenomena, not unlike the original show. The series is probably best remembered for its memorable opening intro and also the Quest World segments were the earliest examples of CGI for television. Production of the show was a certified mess, with Hanna-Barbera firing developer Peter Lawrence and switching out many of the original cast and crew and scrambling to finish what was left. Real Adventures also had a massive marketing campaign leading up to its release. The show aired on Cartoon Network, TBS, and TNT and ended up being canceled after 52 episodes due to low ratings, and the merchandise ended up performing poorly. This did not phase Hanna-Barbera, as they intended to continue to work on projects with their most famous characters, but there would be an unexpected merger that would throw a wrench in those plans. On October 10th, 1996, Ted Turner's Turner Broadcasting would merge with Time Warner, owner of Warner Brothers. Warner would now have three animation studios in their possession, Warner Brothers Animation, Turner Feature Animation, later to be folded into Warner Feature Animation, and now Hanna-Barbera Productions. This would be a fortunate news to the crew who were working on revivals. Ed Scarlett, who would later become a writer for several Scooby-Doo productions in the 2000s, recalls the idea of a Jetsons reboot, which was canceled as soon as the merger happened. Well, we were, um, we walked the halls briefly, my partner Eva Almas and I at the time, um, because they wanted to revive the Jetsons, and he actually, we wrote the script that would have revived it, where, um, if you remember, their their robot housekeeper was Rosie, and they decided they would try something, you know, and this is the future, they would just try something revolutionary. Instead of having a robot housekeeper, this is revolutionary, they thought about bringing a real live person. <laughs> this is the way of the future, as the housekeeper. And they brought in this character that was, that replaced, first of all, the kids, they were all sad because Rosie wasn't working with them anymore. Then this, this obnoxious housekeeper came in a lot who just who cried and had all these human emotions and they realized at the end that they how much they appreciated Rosie and brought her back. Anyway, the um, just when they were about to animate this was the point where 
Hanna Barbera was sold to Warner Brothers, and they did not go ahead with the uh, the Jetson revival series. But we got to uh, we were hired to write the last, uh, or the, the I guess you'd call it kind of a pilot script for the new series that eventually didn't go anywhere. As for Cartoon Network, in 1997, many of the cartoons from Warner Brothers Animation found themselves on the channel, as well as many of the post-1948 Looney Tunes cartoons. That same year, Hanna-Barbera released two more shows spun off from Warner Cartoon, Johnny Bravo and Coward Chicken. Johnny Bravo centers on the bizarre predicaments of our titled character, who sounds like Elvis Presley, looks like James Dean, and moves like Michael Jackson. A buff, self-proclaimed ladies' man who lives with his mother, Buddy Bravo, and is constantly annoyed by the next-door neighbor, Little Susie, Johnny goes to extreme lengths to get a date, but let's not count on things going his way. Creator Van Partible created a short film while studying animation at Loyola Marymount University. Mess of Blues, about three Elvis impersonators. Partible's professor showed it to a friend who worked at Hanna-Barbera. They loved it so much, they asked Van to develop it in a short for their world premiere tunes showcase. The short Johnny Bravo premiered on world premiere tunes March 26, 1995. It was named Tune of the Year in a poll of Cartoon Network viewers. It was followed by Johnny Bravo and the Amazon Woman and Jungle Boy, a one-off short created by Partible, Spoofy Tarzan. Partible, a huge fan of Hanna-Barbera, hired many HB legends when developing the show. Ed Benedict, the man responsible for creating the look of some of the studio's earlier hits, was hired by Partible as a background consultant. Joseph Barbera was also a story consultant and would pal around with the other writers. The show is famous for its smear animation technique. I was watching this one short, this Warner Brothers short called The Dover Boys, and they had this smear technique where you would have one position here, and if you had to get over here, you would just do this giant smear. So instead of in betweening all these things, you would just have one giant drawing. I'm like, I love that. That cuts down on my animation. For the voices, actor Jeff Bennett was chosen to play Johnny due to part of a loving his elf as a impersonation. I remember auditioning and Van saying, you know, I think I heard you do an Elvis impression before, and that's what I want this character to be, is uh, Elvis. And I said, uh, older, young, <laughs> you know, because they're kind of two different voices. Uh, for a while, I slowed down and started to be this kind of guy. And, uh, but when he was young, you know, everything was kind of light and uh, everything rolled off his tongue a little bit more. And they, he said, yeah, yeah, younger, but somewhere in between, but, you know, Hyped. Is it, the thing that made him stand out was the hoo <laughs> He, no one did that. That was all him. And so, when you're listening to all these auditions of people, he played the young, sexy Elvis. Coincidentally enough, Jeff voiced another character at the same time who had a similar Elvis draw. The character texts Tinstar from Disney Snookums and Meat. Yeah, well it is, man. And I just don't like the smell of your donuts, Rongo. Tony and Oscar-nominated actress Brenda Faccaro voiced Bunny Bravo, and Little Susie was voiced by young Mae Whitman. The show debuted in July 1997. Memorable episodes include a crossover with the characters of Scooby-Doo, a schoolhouse rock parody, an episode where Johnny dates a deer, a parody of Green Eggs and Ham involving Susie trying to sell Johnny Girl Scout cookies, and two episodes featuring special appearances from Adam West and Donny Osmond. The series was on hiatus after the first season, but was greenlit for two more. Sadly, Creative Van Partible was let go from the show as a result of the Time Warner merger. Van, who was working on ideas for his eventually scrapped second season with Seth MacFarlane, was replaced by a news production crew from Warner Brothers, who had just finished working on Peaky and the Brain, including Gary Hartle and Kirk Tingblad. Executives at Cartoon Network had one of the new writers, Jed Springarn, create new characters to play off Johnny. These included Geeky Carl, who frequently annoys Johnny, and Pops, the owner of a diner who serves very questionable meals. In addition, the writing became sharper, and the world of Johnny Bravo was redesigned by Hartle and Tingblad. The retooled version was received rather well and lasted until 2002. Part of what we brought back to the series with the 2001 Christmas special and the 2003 Valentine's Day special. These would become so successful, Van would head the show's final season in 2004. While most of the elements of the show's first season returned, 
It wasn't as successful ratings wise and ended in 2004 with the episode Johnny Makeover slash Back on Shaq where Johnny gets a makeover by Don Knotts, Weird Al, and the Blue Falcon and helps Shaquille O'Neal win a basketball game against Seth Green and Huckleberry Howe. Yeah, this is a weird show. The show has become a cult hit. Johnny remained one of CNN's most memorable characters. The show had a spin-off, toys, and launched the careers of several notable names. Johnny was last seen in a 2011 special, Johnny Goes to Bollywood, and the series hasn't yet become available on HBO Max. Could there be a comeback? Time will only tell. Given how children who grew up with the series are now adults, it's a possibility. Thumbs up. I am Johnny Bravo, a mister of the universe. One of Hanna-Barbera's most surreal cartoons during this period was Cow and Chicken, centered around two siblings, a 7-year-old 400-pound cow and her older 11-year-old brother Chicken, who live in suburbia with their human parents, who are only seen from the waist down, constantly have run-ins with the very flamboyant devil named the Red Guy. Creator David Feist had been at Hanna-Barbera since 1978, bringing on an 80s revival of the Jetsons, as well as the feature film. When it came time to submit short for the What A Cartoon Show, David pitched three ideas to exec producer Larry Huber. When I got this call from Larry Huber, who was a, an old friend of mine who'd been working at Hanna Barbera for many years, and he, he said, hey, they're looking for new shorts. Would you like to, to pitch them an idea? I said, yeah, I have a fresh idea. And within a, a number of weeks, it had sold. And within a year, I was doing a series. The short No Smoking premiered November 12, 1995. It was nominated for an Emmy. Arnie's responses to the short was so positive, it was greenlit for a series that premiered July 15, 1997. Cow and Chicken changed my career because it was the first production that was actually my original idea. My jokes and my animation, my style. It was very exciting, it was challenging, but it was, I was having a, a blast. It was just so much fun. The show had a backup segment called I Am Weasel which centered on a beloved, intelligent weasel voiced by Star Trek The Next Generation's Michael Dorn and a dim-witted baboon named IR. The latter tries to upstage Weasel, but with little success. This segment of characters became so popular, they migrated to their own spin-off. Voice legend Charlie Adler voiced four of the main characters, Cow, Chicken, The Red Guy, and IR Baboon. Cow's voice was based on Ellen Green's performance as Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors. While Chicken's voice was based on himself at 11, the show lasted for 52 episodes and ended in 1999. Cow and Chicken would continue to make appearances on later Cartoon Network material, such as Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, several video games, bumpers, and cameos. You, who, will nobody come out to serve us? Sister, you just said a mouthful of something. I'm out of here. As for their creator, David Feist, he would continue to direct shorts, commercials, as well as work on films such as Open Season and Despicable Me 2. Cow and Chicken may not have set the world on fire like some of the other cartoon cartoons, but they do deserve to be acknowledged for helping put CN's original programming on the map. With Hanna-Barbera becoming a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, one of Time Warner's first acts was to close the Cahuenga studio and move Hanna-Barbera and all studio operations, archives, and animation art collection to a new studio in Sherman Oaks, where Warner Brothers Animation was located, as it was too expensive to have Hanna-Barbera operating in its own facility. This would be orchestrated by WB President and former Hanna-Barbera executive Gene McCurdy. There were even rumors of the old studio being torn down or Universal Studios using it for extra office space. The new merger would cause Fred Siebert to resign as president of Hanna-Barbera and would go on to start Federator Studios to develop Oh Yeah cartoons for Nickelodeon. Similar to what a cartoon, the shows that would spin off from Oh Yeah were Chalk Zone, My Life as a Teenage Robot, and The Fairly Odd Parents, all shows created by former HB alumni with the latter show becoming a huge hit for both Nickelodeon and creator Butch Hartman, respectively. In 1997, after being on Cuega Boulevard since 1963, the entire studio was packed up and moved to an office building next door 
to the Sherman Oaks Galleria, where movies like Fast Times at Richmond High and Valley Girl were filmed. The last official recording session done at the old Coenga Studio was the director video film Scooby Doo on Zombie Island, which at the time already started production. The Imperial Bank Building, as it was called, was located on the 14th floor and would become the new home of Hanna Barbera, operating alongside Warner Brothers, where productions like the retooled Johnny Bravo seasons, some of the cartoon cartoon shorts, I Am Weasel, and the early Scooby Doo directed video movies were made. Shortly after the move to Sherman Oaks, Seth MacFarlane would also leave Hanna Barbera after the executives at the Fox Network were impressed by his Larry and Steve shorts and contracted him to create a series based on it. This will result in a previously short-lived, but now long-running series, Family Guy. Along with several other hits he created for Fox, such as American Dad, The Cleavage Show, and The Orville. Another series that was in production at the Coenga Studio, but continued during the move to Sherman Oaks, would be the last television series under the head of Barbera name, though at this point used for marketing purposes. And that was the Powerpuff Girls. With the ingredients of sugar, spice, and everything nice, scientist Professor Utonium accidentally adds Chemical X, which tried to create children of his own. It happens, resulting in the creation of three crime fighting kindergartner superheroes Blossom, the straightforward leader, Bubbles, the happy go lucky innocent, and Buttercup, the rough and tough tomboy. Together, they are known as the Pop of Girls, as they saved the city from Towsville from a rose gallery of villains. The Amoeba Boys, Fuzzy Lumpkins, Him, Princess, The Gang Green Gang, and of course, Mojo Jojo. While also dealing with problems of adolescence. The show is based on a short film creator Greg McCracken made while in his second year at Cal Arts called Whoop Ass Stew. The designs of the girls were influenced by the paintings of Margaret Keane. You remember those big, sad eyed girls, these pathetically upset children? I was doing stupid drawings of those, and I came up with these little girls who were cute. I mean, over the years, they evolved, where now they have even bigger eyes, and they're a little shorter. After graduating from college, Craig got a job working at Hanna-Barbera, and was the art director of Two Stupid Dogs, where he would befriend his future collaborators. Here we were, just a bunch of young kids out of CalArts, kind of given the chance to work on a television series. We started coming in, and we're you know, and we have all these ideas and we want to change stuff and do stuff differently. It was great though, we loved it. We had so much fun. We'd sit down and work and then some days we'd just be going wild for like hours. Craig would end up pitching the whoop ass girls to Margot McDonough. It was then picked up as a series. But then what a cartoon came along and instead of a half hour series, Craig would have a start making a short first with several changes, including replacing the word whoop ass with Powerpuff and replacing the can of whoop ass with Chemical X. The short Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins premiered as the first water cartoon short. Unfortunately, it wasn't as popular as the Dexter's Lab short, and it got harsh reception from a test audience of 11-year-old boys. I'm sitting there with the president of, of Hanna-Barbera and Cartoon Network execs and behind this glass and going, well, there goes my career. I just totally blew it. I'm not going to ever get a chance to make this as a series. Kids weren't as used to watching them. And this had a real personality and attitude and, and voice that nobody had seen. So there was going to be a little bit of a learning curve. Craig like panicked that afternoon. Right. And he came back that evening and redesigned the whole show in a night. I went, they're too weird. They don't have fingers. They don't have ears. And some people thought they were bugs. I was in that focus group. I had a problem with the fingers. But I got this call from Mike Lazo. And he basically told me, he said, Craig, look, we like this short. And I know you got a negative reaction, but I'm much more interested in a negative reaction than a lukewarm reaction. We believe in it, and we want to do another short with it. And with that, the second short, Crime 101, aired January 1996. Turns out, Dexter's Lab, created by Craig's friend, Dendi, was greenlit to be a series first. But Craig came aboard as an art director, a store bar artist. He did a couple of, of boards that I just thought were the best things I'd ever seen. And I remember saying to Mike Lazo at that point, if Craig can do boards that are that funny, he can probably do anything. So maybe we should just go back to Powerpuff. With the education he got working on Dexter's Lab, Craig went back to work on production, and the show premiered in the fall of 1998 
on Cartoon Network and received positive reviews from critics and won several Emmy and Annie Awards. The show didn't just become another hit. No, 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 no. It became a phenomenon. Not only was it a ratings hit, becoming one of the most watched shows on the channel's Friday night schedule, but it was also a merchandising juggernaut. Powerpuff Girls had a wide variety of products, toys, video games, books, albums, t-shirts, comics, even a breakfast cereal. Maybe if we were lucky we'd get maybe like a few t-shirts in a couple of record stores or some hip stores. I mean that's all I really thought could possibly happen. And the next thing you knew it, it, it blew up and it was pretty much everywhere. These are like freaking cool. huge. Yeah, the success of the show led to Warner Brothers greenlighting the Powerpuff Girls movie which debuted in cinemas summer of 2002. The film had very poor marketing from Warner Brothers, who spent all their advertising on a live-action Scooby-Doo movie, as well as having the misfortune of coming out the same summer as Men in Black 2, Like Mike, Lilo and Stitch, and Spider-Man. While receiving positive reviews from critics, the movie ended up becoming a bomb at the box office, grossing $16 million worldwide, over an $11 million budget. In hindsight, maybe I wish it was a little sillier, a little lighter, a little more, not so heavy the whole time. The show aired for two more seasons, without the involvement of Craig, who left the show to create a new show for Cartoon Network, and aired the final season of 2005. This wouldn't be the last we see of the girls, as they would make several different comebacks, such as a reimagined anime adaptation, a, what the hell, several TV specials, a reboot in 2016, as well as an upcoming live action CW series, Powerpuff, by Heather Ringer and Diablo Cody, which for some reason is still happening. Despite this, the original is still seen as a classic, and attracted audiences of all genders, with their timeless characters, sharp writing, and fast-paced action. And it continues to be a fave. Play me out, Tom Kenny. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. So long, everybody. As the 90s would come to a close, the Hanna-Barbera name will slowly but surely begin to disappear from the CN originals. This would be appropriate, as new cartoons would appear on the channel from outside studios, but the network had a hand in producing, such as AKA Cartoons, Ed, Ed and Eddie, Kino Films, Mike Lou and Og, Stretch Films, Courage the Cowardly Dog, and Curious Pictures' Sheep in a Big City and Codename Kiss Next Door. As more and more original programming headed the Cartoon Network, the more classic cartoons were getting phased out. So on April 1st, 2000, Cartoon Network launched its second channel, Boomerang. Originally a programming block for the network's early years, Boomerang was a commercial-free channel aimed at baby boomers who grew up with the likes of Huckleberry Hound, Bugs Bunny, Yaki Doodle, and Gloop and Gleep. It could now watch them 24 hours a day. Now, why does that seem familiar? That same month, Universal released a sequel to the live-action Flintstones movie, The Flintstones of Viva Rock Vegas. Brian Levant returned to direct, but the cast was replaced by Mark Addy as Fred, Stephen Baldwin as Barney, Jen Kowalski as Betty, and Kristen Johnson as Wilma, with Alan Cumming playing a CG Great Kazoo. Critics gave the film negative reviews, but some liked it better than its predecessor. It ended up bombing at the box office, grossing only $59.5 million against its $83 million budget and it marked the end of Universal's licensing of Hanna-Barbera properties. Meanwhile, the CN crew of the Imperial Bank building needed space, which the building never seemed to have much of. The crew would transfer production offices to a new facility in Burbank, Inter Cartoon Network Studios, headed by former Deke employees Jennifer Pelfrey and Brian A. Miller. The studio opened its doors May 22, 2000. It was christened by Joseph Barbera with a bottle of champagne. Robert Alvarez, who worked at Hanna-Barbera since the 70s and still at Cartoon Network Studios to this day, recalls, When we moved to Burbank to start the Cartoon Network Studio, everything changed for the better. Cartoon Network was a lot like the old Hanna-Barbera Studio. I'm glad that we made the move. The first show in production at the new studio was a time-traveling comedy called Time Squad, which would then be followed by Jenny Tartakovsky's Samurai Jack, Grim and Evil, the TV special The Flintstones on the Rocks, Greg McCracken's Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Ben 10, as well as many cartoons the studio continues to make to this day. By the time of the Warner Brothers takeover, 
William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, despite being in their mid-80s, were still coming into work every day, eager to help out, and were given their own offices in the Imperial Bank building. However, on March 22, 2001, an era was over. William Hanna passed away in his home at the age of 90 in North Hollywood and was buried in the Ascension Cemetery in Lake Forest, California. His health was declining for quite some time, and he had Alzheimer's in his later years. His death marked the end of his 70-year partnership with Joe Barbera. The two weren't exactly best friends and rarely interacted outside of work, but they did complement each other's talents and abilities. The two personalities were as different as night and day. Bill and Joe's relationship, uh, I saw them as they were two guys who, who worked together like a machine, and Bill had his area of expertise and Joe had his. They were like totally different. Joe drove a black Cadillac, Bill a white Lincoln. Bill's office is all light colored, lit up beautifully. Joe's just like a nightclub. The, the example of perhaps a, a married couple who know each other so well that they're finishing each other's sentences and speaking in shorthand and such. Yeah, Bill would like run production at the studio. Joe would handle the creative side of things. And they worked together beautifully and such harmony. They really liked each other. After his death, Cartoon Network would air a short bumper in his memory. Directed video movies, Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, Scooby-Doo and the Legend of the Vampire, Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico, and Flintstones on the Rocks were dedicated to Hannah. With Bill's death, the shutdown of the studio and the name was completed and was now fully absorbed into Warner Brothers Animation. The shows Hanna-Barbera made for Cartoon Network were now completely made and owned by Cartoon Network Studios. The studio, which was originally a subsidiary of Hanna-Barbera, was now resurrected as its own separate entity. Some would even say to pick up where Hanna-Barbera left off. Barbera would remain in his office at Warner's, and the Hanna-Barbera characters were now officially part of the Warner Brothers family. The question is, where do we go from here? As the 90s came to a close, and with the new millennium right around the corner, Hanna-Barbera was now entering a new era in the animation world. William Hanna's death in 2001 would lead to the completion of the studio's absorption into Warner Brothers. As such, the newly formed Cartoon Network Studios would continue productions of shows previously made by Hanna-Barbera and original programming for the channel, while Warner Brothers Animation would handle HB's more classic properties and much of the studio's catalog would move to Boomerang once CN's original programming took off. Sometimes the classic Hannah Barbera characters will make humorous cameos in the various CN originals. Now hold on there, Baba Lewis. Ain't nobody gonna do no kind of fighting on this here train on account of you and me. Hey, who turned out the lights? Is it sleepy time already? On top of that, the classic HB characters were declining in popularity with young audiences with the notable exception being Scooby-Doo, whose reruns on Cartoon Network attracted a huge audience and a slew of directed video movies and merchandise selling really well. There's many speculations on how the Hanna-Barbera cartoons became old hat around this time, and what it boils down to is, well, competition. Mostly from networks like Disney Channel and Nickelodeon, but there was also Japanese anime making its debut in the US in the late 90s. Shows like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and a phenomenon known as Pokemon. New studios like Pixar are on the rise, with DreamWorks following with hits like Shrek. In 1999, Nickelodeon would debut SpongeBob SquarePants, which took the world by storm. Because of this, it seems like kids no longer care for cartoon animals and cavemen based on vaudeville comedians. The parents who grew up with them, however, well, that's a different story. Isn't that right, Mike Laszlo?
Okay, we're gonna rewind a bit here. For the uninitiated, Mike Laszlo was the vice president of programming of Cartoon Network's Adult Swim. Laszlo got his start in the shipping and receiving department at Turner Broadcasting, moving his way up to programming, TBS Superstations, Animation Block until 1993, when he moved to Cartoon Network in charge of the channel's programming and became vice president the following year. At that time, Cartoon Network was still relatively new and was known as a channel that reruns old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, which greatly annoyed Laszlo. And, and so many of these cartoons weren't exactly gold, but uh, we thought we could uh, have fun with some of them. And, and so eventually that's what we started doing, mainly out of necessity. Every afternoon uh, around 3 o'clock we would get together for a programming meeting. And this just happened to be around the time we would show action uh, cartoons, Space Ghost, uh, Early Birdman, Dino Boy, uh, The Fantastic Four. Um, and, and so these cartoons would be playing as we were talking about how could we program uh, to have fun, uh, to do dif different stunts the, the audience would enjoy. And it just seemed like Gary Owen's uh, big Space Ghost voice was always booming out of one of our offices, which would amuse us. And at the same time, the, the late night wars were going on with, with Jay Leno and David Letterman. And we said, you know, we, we ought to... We ought to introduce Gary Owens. We ought to introduce Space Ghosts into the late night wars, uh, just as a joke. And somehow that stuck. <laughs> and we ended up uh, actually trying to bring that to fruition. This would, of course, lead to the launch of the very first Cartoon Network original series, Space Ghosts Coast to Coast. For those unaware, Space Ghosts was one of Hanna Barbera's famous action cartoons that aired on Saturday mornings from 1966 to 1967. It was paired up with another show, Dino Boy in the Lost Galaxy. The action adventure show featured the titular Space Ghost, whose booming voice was originally provided by Laugh-In's Gary Owen, fighting many villains, along with the help of two teenagers, Jason Jan, and a monkey named Blip. Nowadays to the modern viewer, the show seems pretty standard, but when it first aired, it was pretty popular, and along with many action-oriented HB cartoons, it broke new ground for the studio, especially with the art courtesy of Alex Toth. Fast forward to the 90s, Coast to Coast featured Space Ghost as a host of a talk show when he interviewed celebrity guests and accompanied by band leader Zorak and his producer Motar, who were originally two recurring villains in the original series. As they constantly interrupt the show, the idea came from Mike and a team at Cartoon Network trying to promote a marathon for the original series as well as coming up for names for said marathon. According to Betty Cohen, Mike Lazo booked some time to come see me one day and said, I want to show you something my team and I have been working on. He put a VHS cassette into my machine, and it was the first incarnation of Space Ghost. It was so rough that there were times when he was having to personally narrate, and it was all on a rotoscope, which is sort of like cutting and pasting. But I immediately saw the potential. For the earliest funding, I actually allocated money from the marketing budget. Even getting guest stars proved to be difficult. You know, the interesting thing is in, in the earliest days is we couldn't get anybody uh, really to come on the show. Uh, we would call and explain, well, we're going to have you interviewed by Space Ghost, a 1966 cartoon. And they would say, no thanks. Uh, so we, we rapidly just started going to almost anybody. And we ended up with what you would call, you know, C-list uh, celebrities. And we found out that that was actually more fun than, uh, than dealing with the, you know, the five or six uh, agents and publicists and, and whoever else uh, to try and get somebody that you might have heard on on. <laughs> the show had an innovative production process. This is where Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, comes together, where editor Tom Roach pirates animation from the old series. All the elements live on this one tape. They're all here. We use this one 90-minute tape over and over again. We start with just snow, and then from snow, we put uh, the guest in. So what we'll do is we'll take this shot, we'll take the mat, and key that right on top. Now, there's Michael Stipe. Now, I put him in a box where I can move him around. Then we move to this shot, and then Space Ghost and Michael Stipe are ready to carry on a conversation. This group takes the interview and writes and rewrites a script around it. An artist creates some new pictures to supplement the 1960s animation. So it's going basically from here to here in about seven drawings. Coast to Coast premiered April 15, 1994 and aired Friday nights, immediately becoming a hit. 
spawning several spin-offs and became a launching pad for Cartoon Network's late night blog Adult Swim in 2001. Adult Swim, as the name suggests, was the channel's programming block aimed towards adult audiences. Before then, Cartoon Network experimented with catering to adult viewers with late night showings of uncensored cartoons from the 40s and 50s at blocks like Toon Heads, The Tex Avery Show, Late Night Black and White, and an anthology of Canadian animated shorts called O Canada. Not to mention Toonami's Midnight Run showing uncut anime. Adult Swift's production house was Laszlo's Ghost Planet Industries, later renamed William Street Studios, located in Atlanta, Georgia. It's the home for many of their hit shows and shares headquarters with TBS and TNT. Last year I even visited the studio while I was on vacation. The block launched September 2nd, 2001. It had a revelant and cynical feel that appealed to teens and college students. It would later become the home to adult cartoons that didn't really survive their run on broadcast network television. For anime that was too adult for Tsunami, like Cowboy Bebop. As mentioned, Space Ghost launched several spin-offs and even shows inspired by it. But for the sake of this retrospective, the one most appropriate to talk about is... <laughs> Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. The idea is genius. Birdman, another former HB superhero from the 60s, Birdman and the Galaxy Trio, leaves superhero work behind to become a lawyer, representing various Hanna-Barbera characters. Whether it's defending Fred Flintstone, who believes he's a Mafia Don, trying to prove Scooby-Doo and Shaggy's innocence as they get arrested for marijuana use, or representing Dr. Ben and Quest, who is in a custody battle with Ray's Bannon over Johnny Quest and Haji. The show had a memorable use of using the classic Hanna-Barbera characters, many of whom have fallen out of the public eye in recent years, and most of the humor surrounding them was written in a somewhat cynical tone that appealed to boomers and Gen Xers who remember these characters from childhood, and it worked without being too obnoxious and hackneyed. According to co-creator Eric Richer, I think it's funny when you've seen all these kind of... There's a nostalgia. Even if it was way before your time, there's an awareness of these characters, right? I mean, the most famous ones are, you know, still in spots. Fred Flintstone and Scooby-Doo, but even the Huck Hounds and Adam Ants, there's an awareness of them. They're so earnest. There's something really great about the earnestness of all entertainment back in those days. And I think it was, we were talking about those characters and not taking pot shots at them. We were giving them a less earnest, allowing them to have a less earnest side of their personalities that was also part of their personalities, if that makes sense. We weren't laughing at them, we were actually allowing them to expand a little bit, you know? Letting Adam Ant be pissed off, you know? You'd never see that in the original cartoons. Instead it was like, he's a very happy-go-lucky character. So there's that thing too, where you're just kind of expanding them a little bit and allowing them to be themselves a little bit more. And also, there was just stuff that made total sense. Well, of course, if this person had an offstage life, they would think this about that, you know? There was just always an, of course, that would be how Huck Hound would feel about that. There was just an inherent, I think why it worked on Cartoon Network was that the network was, and continues to be, a crazy patchwork quilt of things where it's like there's some really dissimilar things, but they all feel like they're part of the same quilt, you know? That's because of the development and the curatorial quality of it where it feels like, oh, this is a crazy art show, but it all belongs to the same building, you know? The obscure 1970s Hanna-Barbera cartoon, Sea Lab 2020, also had a notable Adult Swim update. Hesh wants some sex! Hesh, get off! My tape's Shut up. playing! Debbie, get down here! Give Hesh some sex! Hesh, this isn't funny! Be real funny when I crack you with a pipe! Brendan Stimpy creator John Kay and his studio Spumco made their own series of shorts based on popular Hanna-Barbera characters. The results... speak for themselves. The first of these was a Yogi Bear short. Booboo Runs Wild, aired in prime time on a pre-adult swim Cartoon Network, September 24th, 1999. The short featured Ranger Smith enforcing too many rules in the park, and an ironic twist, it's Boo Boo that gets fed up with this, and goes feral, terrorizing the park. To say this short is odd would be putting it mildly, more violent and grotesque as opposed to the more limited animated dialogue heavy originals. Mike Lasso praised the short, but Joseph Barbera was not as pleased. According to Iwo Takamoto, If there had been anyone Joe really wanted to see whacked, it would have been a much younger cartoon maker who, many years later, used classic Hanna-Barbera characters for a new short. The results did not please Joe. 
When he saw the cartoon in question, all he said was, I want him dead. Other shorts would follow, like The Day in the Life of Ranger Smith, a mostly forgettable follow-up, save for one scene that references Ranger Smith's inconsistent designs from the old show, and the incredibly unpleasant Jetson short, The Best Son, which featured George and Jane Jetson scolding Elroy for his bad behavior and screaming at each other. Because that's comedy, I guess. So how come when he does something awful, he's my son? And when he does something good, he's your son? Shut up! Other projects like 2001's The Flintstones on the Rocks featured a darker, more realistic look at Fred and Wilma's marriage troubles, while a live-action Scooby-Doo movie, which had been in development hell since the early 90s, was originally written as a more adult take of the classic cartoon, parody in the same vein as a Brady Bunch movie, but that was eventually watered down to be suitable for family audiences, though some adult jokes ended up surviving the final cut. And now, this message. Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible allows you to listen to audiobooks and podcasts on any device, whether it be a smartphone, iPad, or tablet, and it picks up right where you left off, with thousands of titles to choose from. The book I'm reading now is The Fresh Prince Project, How the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air Remixed America by Chris Palmer, an in-depth look at the history of one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Sign up for a 30-day free trial, and your first audiobook is covered. Go to audible.com slash cartoon guy. Again, that's audible.com slash cartoon guy. Now, back to the show. Joseph Barbera, now in his 90s, still playing an active role representing the Hanna-Barbera side of Warner Brothers Animation, which the former was now an in-name only unit. Mostly as an executive producer for many Scooby-Doo spinoffs, directed video movies, and live action feature films, as well as new Tom and Jerry productions, with a new slew of directed video movies and a TV series for Saturday morning called Tom and Jerry Tales. Even at his older age, Joe was still pitching ideas for cartoons. One he pitched for a while was a show called Back to Square One, which according to Gene McCurdy was much like a Flintstone situation, but almost relatable today. However, nothing really came of it. Joe became more involved in these projects as much as he could, providing the voice of Tom's owner in the admittedly dull Tom and Jerry short the Mansion Cat. We're going out. The house is spick and span, and I want to find it that way when we get back. And don't try to blame the mouse like you did last time. And coming up with the stories for the Tom and Jerry directed video movie, Fast and the Furry, and the What's New Scooby-Doo episode, Homeward Hound, which according to writer Tom Minton, originally started out as a straight-to-video movie. But perhaps Joe's finest achievement during this period was his swan song, the final theatrical Tom and Jerry short, the Karate Guard. The short, a semi-remake of the 1943 cartoon, The Bodyguard, features Jerry learning karate to protect himself from Tom, and gains a spiritual mentor, voiced by Keon Young, who gives him a karate guard, here played by Spike the Dog, who will arrive at his aid when he bangs on a gong. The short is pretty funny and with stellar animation and well-timed slapstick violence not seen in Tom and Jerry in a long time. Joe was heavily involved in the short, coming up with the story, sketching it out on slips of paper, and even drawing the storyboards with the help of Iwo Takamoto. The short was produced and co-directed by Warner Brothers animators Spike Brandt and Tony Cervoni, who were recruited by former Warner Brothers animation head Gene McCurdy when the short was in production around 2001. According to Spike Brandt, The reason it took so long to make this short was for most of the time there was no budget and we were just working on it between other projects and in our spare time. When most of the rough animation was done, we had a good pencil test, we put together a budget to complete it. Still, there was no money to complete it. Mr. B was in his mid-90s at this point, and I felt bad they couldn't find the funds. I asked if I could get the money, if we could finish it. They said yes, so I called Sam Register at Cartoon Network, who we had worked with on Duck Dodgers, and told him about the cartoon. He told us to send over the pencil test. After they saw it, Cartoon Network came up with the money to finish it. The short had a limited release in theaters fall 2005 and debuted on Cartoon Network winter the following year. It was a nostalgic love letter to the original Tom and Jerry cartoons Joe and Bill made many years ago. The familiar of the short in terms of plot and gags can't be forgiven since it came from a 94-year-old man 
who had admittedly been out the cartoon game for a while now. But to be fair for Joe, he didn't miss a beat. In April of 2006, many of Joe's closest friends and colleagues gathered at Warner Bros. Animation to celebrate his belated birthday, including famed voice director the late Gordon Hunt and voice actors Lucille Bliss, Janet Waldo, John Stevenson, and Jude Foray. Unfortunately, Joe Barbera, the other half of the legendary animation duo, surrounded by his peers, would not be long for this world, because on December 18th, 2006, at the age of 95, he would pass away. He died in his home in Studio City in Los Angeles, California, and buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. His final project was writing the story for the director video movie, Tom and Jerry, A Nutcracker Tale, and was even dedicated to him. Much like with Hannah's death, the animation world came together to mourn the loss of an icon. For me personally, I'll never forget seeing this bumper on Cartoon Network in middle school and being bummed out that whole day. Just say Tom and Jerry, friends know us, school we do. You just feel it when you make them. The magic was there and it worked. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? With both founders no longer with us, three if you count George Sidney, who died in 2002, and the HB properties now owned by Warner Brothers, you would think the story of Hanna-Barbera would stop here. You being correct. Today, Warner Brothers have been steadily keeping the Hanna-Barbera and Tom and Jerry properties in the public eye. Characters can be seen on merchandise, commercials, and the occasional film, theatrical, or director video. The old studio at 3400 Cahuaga Boulevard, which was previously saved for demolition, thanks to passionate responses from Joseph Barbera and the public, is now rightfully preserved as a historic landmark and still remains at the same location. The 2010s and now the 2020s mark an experimental revival period with other HB characters, whether it be shamelessly using the Flintstones and the Jesses to promote WWE, a wacky racist reboot more centered on meta humor, even Bill and Joe's Tom and Jerry would get several new shows and movies. Some revivals and reimaginings would even be aimed toward adult audiences, like a new series of DC Comics called Hanna-Barbera Beyond, featuring a more edgy and darker takes on various characters like Scooby Apocalypse, set in the Mystery Ink Gang in a post-apocalyptic future, Exit Stage Left, The Snagglepuss Chronicles, which has Snagglepuss as a gay playwright in the 50s, and The Flintstones, a more modern take on a modern Stone Age family. Also, the Banana Splits movie and Velma happened. Yeah. In 2017, as part of the 60th anniversary, Warner Bros. re-released many of the classic HB and Tom and Jerry cartoons on DVD as the Hanna-Barbera Diamond Collection, previously known as the Golden Collection. That same year, the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, held a Hanna-Barbera theme exhibit, Hanna-Barbera, The Architects of Saturday Morning, celebrating the legacy of Hanna-Barbera and their studio, featuring 254 original artwork, including cells, drawings, storyboards, and production art, Vintage merchandise and interviews with former HB animators Jerry Eisenberg, Tony Benedict, Bob Singer, and Willie Idol. Perhaps the biggest project in the recent years to feature Hanna Barbera properties would be the 2020 CG animated film Scoob. The film is an origin story of how Scooby Doo and Shaggy met. The two eventually grow up to be mystery solvers with Fred, Daphne, and Velma, and Scooby is being pursued by a supervillain. Dick Dashley, who needs him to unlock the gates of the underworld. Other Hanna-Barbera characters who appeared in the film, including an intelligent dynamut, Dee Dee Sykes from Captain Caveman, Captain Caveman himself, and the Blue Falcon, or in this case his son, Brian. The film was first announced in 2014 and was originally called SCOOB. It would have featured Shaggy and Scooby joining more Hanna-Barbera characters as a much larger team, not unlike Marvel's The Avengers such as Grape Ape, Adamant, and Penelope Pistop in a supporting role. And by the concept art, the film was supposed to be much darker too. In the director's chair was the aforementioned Tony Cervoni, who had previously done a lot of Scooby-Doo material, and actor Dax Shepard, who was originally on board as a co-director until he was dropped for the project. Ditto for Edge of 17 screenwriter Kelly Fermont Craig, who wrote the original script, and replaced by four other writers. The biggest controversy of the film was replacing the voice actors from Mystery Inc. with big name celebrities, 
which didn't bode well with some of the actors as well as the fans. Frank Welker, however, reprised his role as Scooby-Doo, who he had been voicing since 2002. The film was originally supposed to be released on September 21st, 2018, but pushed back to May 2020. But the unfortunate COVID-19 lockdown put a wrench in those plans, opting to go to digital download instead, which had a huge success. The film would eventually have a theatrical run much later, where it earned $2.2 million in the US and Canada and $27.1 million worldwide. Critics were mixed on the film, with some praising the animation while criticizing the story. One of the highlights of the film, at least in my opinion, are all the easter eggs to Hanna-Barbera's history. Any fan of HB will sure to love. The idea of a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe is now up in the air. With the unfortunate merger of Warner Media and AT&T with Discovery, Warner Bros. Discovery and its new head, David Zaslav, have canceled a prequel spinoff, Scoop Holiday Hunt, which was supposed to be released last year and was already completed. The prequel film is now one of the many animated projects that become a tax write-off, with Warner having no plans to release it. Thanks, genius. In 2021, Bill and Joe's Cat and Mouse duo will return to the big screen yet again and Tom and Jerry, where the two wreak havoc at a fancy hotel managed by a young woman played by Chloe Grace Moretz. The day of a royal wedding, directed by Barbershop's Tim Story and written by Kevin Costello of Brixby Bear fame, critics were not kind to the film. It received negative reviews from the performances of the human characters and the script, but the scenes capturing the spirit of the original Tom and Jerry shorts were praised. The movie was also accompanied by new shorts by the same team for 2020's Looney Tunes cartoons. Warner Brothers will revive the Hanna-Barbera name for a new studio, or most appropriately, a rebranding of an old studio. Hanna-Barbera Studios Europe, formerly Cartoon Network Studios Europe, the UK division of Cartoon Network Studios, headed by Warner Brothers Animation President Sam Register and head of Kids EMEA Vanessa Brookman. The studio already has many future projects in development, such as a movie based on a Cartoon Network series, The Amazing World of Gumball, Two Craig McCracken-led revivals of his hit shows, Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Another New Wacky Races, a revival of SWAT Cats, and many more. But 2021 will also see the release of the HBO Max series, Jellystone, a reimagining of the Hanna-Barbera characters, namely the more classic ones like Yogi Bear, Boo Boo, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Draw McGraw, and the first time they appeared in any new series since 1991's Yo Yogi more chaotic and wacky update of the old characters, but in my opinion, it really works. The series was developed by C.H. Greenblatt, known for creating the Cartoon Network series Chowder and the Nickelodeon series Harvey Beaks. Greenblatt grew up with the Hanna-Barbera cartoons as a kid and admired the studio's cast of characters, so when making the show, he decided to have them all live in one single town, i.e. Jellystone, and give him major roles in said town. Yogi, Boo Boo, and Cindy are doctors at the town hospital, Huckleberry Hound is the mayor, Snogopus is a talk show host, etc. In addition, since many of HB's characters are predominantly male, some of the lesser known characters are gender swap, like Augie Doggy, Choo Choo, Jabberjaw, Yaggy Doodle, Loopy Dee Loop, and Hardy Har Har. The show even includes appearances from characters from HB's 60s action cartoons, like Johnny Quest and Haji and Shazam, redrawn to fit the show's comedic style. Even the more obscure characters make their way in the show. The clever thing about this new series is its use of familiar IPs, while at the same time not being too reliant on nostalgia. I had to make a decision early on in development about what I wanted to do with these characters and how I knew, here's, I don't, I'm not a nostalgia person. I don't care about nostalgia. I don't, you're never going to win with nostalgia. You can't win that battle. You'll never beat nostalgia. You can't. <laughs> like, no, because nostalgia is emotionally connected to people's memories of their childhood and you cannot and will not beat that. And this is where I said I had to approach it as if I was making a show for myself. What would I do? How would I do it? How would it look? And if I made it look like classic Hanna-Barbera, I feel like then I'm competing with the stuff that was done out of Adult Swim, like Harvey Birdman, Mm -hmm. and Space Ghost and those shows, right? And I love those shows, but I wanted to separate this from how those looked and felt. And those had a foot firmly rooted in the aesthetic of the old Hanna-Barbera style. 
The show is really funny, and I honestly recommend checking it out. So this will conclude the fantastic legacy of Hanna-Barbera. We saw Bill and Joe's humble beginnings at MGM, their studios rise in the 60s, its eventual foldings into larger corporations, their inevitable ends, and the legacy both men have left behind. And while the tradition of Saturday morning cartoons are extinct, the classic HB characters now have a presence on streaming services, such as the Boomerang app and HBO Max. I've been a fan of Hanna-Barbera since I watched reruns of their cartoons as a little kid in the late 90s and early 2000s on Cartoon Network. As an animator and cartoonist myself, I consider Bill and Joe my major influences, and in a way, this retrospective was to celebrate what they brought to the animation industry and me standing up for them while everyone else seems to disregard them. What can maybe argue that cartoons were responsible for the toxic notion of the cartoons are made for kids mindset, and maybe for a while they did put quantity over quality, both very fair criticisms. But I think what these two men did for animation and the many milestones they achieved should be acknowledged. Their second show became the first animated program to ever win an Emmy. They created the first ever primetime cartoon aimed at adults. Their studio was the first to use digital ink and paint, beating Disney to the punch who will use caps many years later. Their huge library will help launch the first cable channel dedicated to cartoons, and they will be responsible for creating the most popular and recognizable cartoon characters in history. And they, much like their creators, will be remembered for years to come. Thank you William Hanna, thank you Joseph Barbera, and thank you to the rest of the talented artists, writers, animators, producers, and crew at Hanna-Barbera for four decades of entertaining the world. Unless you got teamwork, there's no team. And thank all of you for joining me. This took me three years to complete, and now it's finally done. I'm so proud of this series, and having people responded to it so positively. I hope all of you will stick around for my next big project, my top 30 favorite cartoons. Until next time, I'm 47 Cartoon Guy, and I gotta fly. If you'd like to support this series and many other videos, click the link below to our Patreon. You could get a special credit at the end of each video and a shout out to your YouTube channel or blog, a commission by me, and now my $5 tier, in addition to early access and special credits, you can request a Hanna-Barbera special or movie for me to review as part of my fantastic legacy of Hanna-Barbera Mini Soul series. A lot goes into the making of these videos and your help can make production go smoother. In terms of me paying for software, research materials, etc. And as always, if you're not able to donate, you could help by liking, commenting, subscribing, and clicking the bell icon. I thank you, and I gotta fly. I'll catch you later.